Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. So Hey guys, welcome to episode 221 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy, here with David Park. And our guest on tonight's show, we're really excited to have Mark Graney on the show. Mark is the author of the Gray Man series. He's also the author of a whole slew of books in the Tom Clancy series. You did Armored. Yeah. Uh, what's the the other one I'm leaving out? Red Metal. Red Metal. Yeah, yeah, co-authored that one. Uh, and uh, many of you, you know, probably out there, your first introduction to Mark's work is through a big Netflix film, The Gray Man, uh, which was done with uh, the Russo brothers directing and starred uh, Ryan Gosling, Chris, Chris Evans, Evans yeah. uh, Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah. I mean, huge movie. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. we'll get into all of that. Sure. So, Mark, thanks for joining us. Today. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've been a fan of this show for a couple of years. I've probably, was telling you, I've probably listened to 50 to 75 episodes while I'm working out. I love it. That's we we appreciate it, man. And, uh, you know, the reason why I wanted to have you on the show for so long is because I've been a big fan of the Gray Man series thanks, since man. you started publishing it, since, you know, book one. And uh, I've been trying to get through as many of the later novels as I could before we did this interview. I made it up to uh, book nine. That's pretty good. So I'm not quite there. <laughs> I'm getting there. Next time around, I'll have it. I'll, <laughs> I'll be totally up to date. Um, but let's start off. I'd like to hear a little bit about you, if you could tell us about, you know, sort of like your origin story, your sort of background that eventually takes you into writing. Yeah. So I, I there can't be that many people that have no prior military service that have been on your show. Well, so law feel, enforcement. Yeah. Okay. There you go. So I'm neither. Um, yeah. So I born in Memphis, Tennessee. My dad, I, I think the thing that started to set me on this path was my dad was the uh, station manager of the NBC affiliate in Memphis and worked there for 50 something years. So I grew up around the news and I grew up fascinated by the news. My dad was also a uh, Second World War Army uh, combat vet. Um, 33 days of combat in Germany, the war ended. He was on a boat in uh, Manila Bay when the wow. when the bomb when the so he was going over to the Japan the, to Japan and um, I think they declassified it in the mid 90s or whatever. But his army division, which is, doesn't exist anymore, the 91st. Um, was going to be the first army division in Tokyo um, behind the Marines or whatever. So, uh, you know, that he, if they invaded, if they had invaded. Yeah. So they, they like they released the plans in the 90s of, wow. of the invasion of, of you know, the mainland. Um, so anyway, uh, so I, I grew up fascinated with the Second World War, re reading a ton of nonfiction. I also live in the South. I live in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, Shiloh is a big uh, Civil War battlefield a couple hours away, and we'd go there with scouts and stuff like that. So I was really fascinated by the Civil War, and I just read tons and tons of nonfiction. Um, I never really wanted to join the military when I was young, young. Um, I did later, but um, I was kind of interested in State Department. Like I, uh, That was sort of like what I was very much interested in. I got a, my degree in political science and international relations from uh, University of Memphis and um, was just really fascinated with that kind of stuff. I would think I was 19, I picked up a Tom Clancy novel, never read any fiction at all and um, loved it. It was Patriot Games. So it was, it was basically, everybody had been talking about him since Red October. Mm -hmm. I had no interest in reading. I, you know, I was, a submarine. Yeah, uh, I, yeah, I was just kind of, you know, douchey kid that I was like, you know, why read fiction? Because there's so much interesting stuff happens in the world. Well, I studied the IRA a lot. I was very interested in the Irish Republican Army. And I've been over to Europe a couple times, just like class trips and stuff when I got out of high school. And uh, and then I saw this book, Patriot Games, Clancy, and it was about the Irish Republican Army. So I was like, I'll you know take a look at it. Changed my life in, in many, many ways. 25 years later, I'm writing books with him. But um, I read that book and I was just like, wow, you can have a lot of fun learning shit too. You know, it's not just like uh, nonfiction where you're reading, you know, more dry yeah. stuff, which not all not, not nonfiction is dry, but um, I just became obsessed with thrillers and espionage thrillers and military thrillers. And so I read anybody you can think of that was around in the 80s and 90s. And um, 
yeah, so I, I was like 21 and I got an idea for a book and started piddling with it uh, very sporadically. And I spent 15 years writing one book <laughs> and I finished it, didn't do anything with it. Um, like my joke is like the internet was invented while I was writing the book. And so <laughs> when I finished writing the book, I could Google like how to be a writer and right. like, Oh yeah, I did everything wrong. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> I should have done that. I should have looked yeah. into that. I should have bought a book on being a writer. So, but the other aspect of it was I had, I spent 15 years on that book, but when I finished it and it became this tangible thing, I was like, all right, how much did I really work? I didn't work for 15 years. You know, I was, I was lazy, lazy 99.8% of the time or whatever. So I wrote my second book in like seven months and, uh, the gray man, which was my first published novel is actually my fourth novel. So I got rejected, you know, several times. And then, um, I got published in 2009 and, uh, it was just a paperback release. It wasn't like a big, you know, the gray man didn't come out like this big barn burner or anything, although it did sell to Hollywood. Um, before it even came out. Oh, really? Be be before we get into the gray man, yeah. I don't want to gloss over, first of all, your hair metal days. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and also you were a big, uh, you were really into soccer too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I played soccer in high school, didn't play in college, but started playing in, uh, I, I moved down to Miami to, to work for a job and started playing um, pickup games with uh, all Islanders. So, you know, like Jamaicans and Dominicans. I was like the only like cool big white dude in the back. You know, I, I remember uh, I took a, a long shot and scored, and then I tried another shot a few minutes later. I was a defender, so I, I wasn't the guy to take a shot. And I, I'll never forget this. I take a second shot and miss, and then the the captain of our team comes up to me. And he's like, "Granny, Christmas come but once a year." <laughs> so I was like, "All right, no more shooting for the fullback." And I didn't. I, didn't. I, I know how to take orders. So, um, yeah, but even b before that, I played drums, and this was the mid... I graduated from high school in 85, so, um, you know, as far as having photographs of me at a younger age, I, it was kind of the worst time in history to, to have photos, because I'll, I'll show my stepkids pictures of me in 1985, and I had, like, really long hair, kind of a mullet, a perm, um, you know, eyeliner, and we were playing, uh, my band was, you know, playing shows and stuff, and so we were doing well locally um but you know it it's kind of what i wanted to do and it, it wasn't even military and honestly my like first experience at that age with military this is probably de self-defeating to tell this story but there is a there's a bar in memphis called silky o'sullivan's it's down in a basement and the ceilings are like you know six inches taller than me and it's a crappy little place but my band would play there every time my band didn't have a show we would play there because they would always give us a couple hundred bucks to play so um you know millington naval air station is the largest inland naval base in the world it's right there in memphis or it was the largest inland naval base in the world which is kind of a weird yeah thing yeah. inland naval base the uh is that uh manufacturing ammunition uh no they don't manufacture i know there's a lot of training and stuff okay. there, there was aircraft they have the runway and all that but anyway so you got all these 18 year old navy guys that would go to these bars you know and it's like i was i was this long hair guy in a band I'll always almost get my ass kicked every weekend or i'd be talking to somebody on between sets and i'd hear somebody start playing my drums i'm like God damn it this is gonna be some like 18 year old kid from new york or or, or nebraska or something he's like you know he's drunk on natural light and uh so <laughs> yeah right i was, was kind of like yeah. i was going like yeah. you know it's like i totally respect the military my dad was in the military but i just i just don't want to go s sit in a dorm with these guys yeah <laughs> you know yeah it's like this yeah kind of thing uh, later in my life after i graduated from college um i did try and get into air force ocs and didn't make it um you know I went through the interview and all that kind of stuff but uh they they didn't take me I think it had something to do. I spoke German uh, at the time. Don't don't test me on it now. It's been a while. But um, I made good grades in college. I, I This was Clinton had been president for about a year. You remember the big downsizing, yeah. Yeah. all that stuff? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. like all these bases. Were, so it was, a, it was a little bit tougher to get in there. There was no, nothing on the horizon. And it was the peace dividend. You know, Soviet Union is no more. You know, what do we need an army for? Uh, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. So I Unless you were a general officer, had you been like somehow able to skip the line and become a general officer, they would have taken your heartbeat because 
Because <laughs> that's what everybody was. Because they love general officer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I I, th I don't think we should move past your hair metal days uh, hey, though, because it's your dime, the, Because the eighties, but the eighties was like I graduated in eighty eight. Like the eighties uh -huh. was the prime like time for metal, right? Yeah, it, yeah. It, big revolt from like disco and yeah. and whatnot, and and uh, even MTV had the Headbangers Ball. Like, yeah. who were your influences? Who did you guys like? Oh well, so there's who we liked, and then who we covered, you know, emulated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So we we loved Iron Maiden. Yeah, I love Deep Purple, Rainbow, um, that era stuff. Zeppelin, uh -huh. Zeppelin of course. Um, even if you didn't like Zeppelin, you couldn't admit it. But I mean, I'm, I'm a big Zeppelin fan. Um, so I liked that kind of stuff. Um, honestly, Deep Purple was probably my favorite. Yeah. Um, but my band, by the time we were really playing things, it was probably like '87. We were really playing around a lot. It was, it was, it was more Bon Jovi. It was some and, glam you know, the, rock. And, yeah, and, and exactly. Not, yeah. And yeah. then I think we you, Journey, but kind of like the, you know, any way you want it. You know, yeah. like the harder Journey. You know, like that. Those types of songs. Yeah. And we would do like uh, some White Snake, but kind of make it sort of funky and you know, i'm a big white snake fan yeah or we would do like a beatles song and do like a hard rock version of it i remember we had like a heavy metal version of the hawaii hawaii 50 theme song it was kind of fun that's awesome um, yeah so um yeah and it just kind of fizzled out you know it just it just became this thing where you know we weren't getting big enough two of the guys that i was in a band with i'm still good friends with and they're both like amazing musicians who play all the time and my wife who I got married uh, less than three years ago. She was talking to them and she was asking about some story that I told about, you know, some show or whatever. And they were just looking at her like she had a third eye. And I was like, <laughs> baby, that was my heyday. That wasn't their heyday. Right, you know, right. it's like that was a blip on the radar for those dudes. I hadn't played drums, you know, in a long time. I've got an electric kit now. So I, I just play for like stress relief, but it really causes more stress <laughs> because it's like if there's something you used to be really good at and you can't do yeah. it anymore. Same thing with soccer. I can't play soccer anymore. I hurt my uh, back and leg and, um, and I coached my son's stepson's team and and i'll go out there and i'll play but i'm like yeah the age 12 is about where <laughs> you know yeah. i'm competitive well, with these yeah, guys yeah, yeah. a couple of years uh, older and and i'm not but um yeah i, I love playing drums and I, I like music and um you know i wouldn't trade it for the world although i do have a lot of really incriminating photos of me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> still out there so so you you know so are you still playing so you did you did your band start in high school and you played through college or how did how yeah did it started in high school and i was in college i always say the reason i didn't ever join a frat was because we played frat parties and sorority parties like every weekend it's like uh -huh. i had wanted nothing to do with those people <laughs> um which you know i've i've, I've mellowed and, and changed since then but that was just that but you might you guys must have been good enough if you were if you could just show you like get a gig at the bar to pay because yeah. that's for a lot of musicians like even that is a dream especially yeah. in like in high school right? yeah no we it yeah it was really really cool and and we won some like battle of the bands and stuff like that and uh we you know played in different states and all that which sounds really cool until it's like yeah you're the one driving the u-haul right. and you're falling asleep at the wheel and and uh you know that the, the guy that sort of managed our band was like you know if you'd spent more than two dollars on a meal they were gonna like rip your head off. you know it was, it was real like fiscally like tight yeah and miserable you know and um it's but it's cool that it happened you know it's sure like, I, I i couldn't do it now so but I it, had... I, I, a is it true that every high schooler wants to be in a band to get chicks and b did it work Yes and kinda. Um, <laughs> I was I was I I did it wrong. I always had a steady girlfriend um, <laughs> at that point, which was not doing it wrong. I'm, I'm joking, but um, yeah, it was kind of to get chicks, you know. And it, it's funny because like I love soccer so much, and I played soccer in in high school, and now like I go to like my nephew's soccer game or my stepson's soccer game. And like the senior soccer players have these huge posters up and it's like, you know, granny number four or whatever. And I'm going like, 
Nobody gave it. You know, right, it's, right. it's like like that would get you some girls, you know. Yeah. But like back when I played <laughs> soccer, it's like if you were a football player. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Piece right. Of shit. And uh, so I was like, yeah, we go out to the soccer field and get like eight people to watch us. And now they have, you know, they charge, they have concessions and all this other stuff. I'm going like, wow, oh, this this is when I wish I was playing soccer. Yeah. That's so awesome. during this time frame, you're also you know dabbling. You're writing on the side almost as a, as a, like a hobby. Yeah, but. Not really sure where it's going to go. What What were the first that you said there were like three, three novels before you sold your first book? I mean, sort of like what were those three books about? What were you trying to do there? What were you trying to accomplish? Yeah. There? So my first book, the one I spent 15 years on, I like it's a it's a really good story and I really be- believe in the story, but it'll never come out because it's like the car in your backyard where all the good parts have been taken out of it, you know, cause I, anything that was cool in that book has ended oh, up in right. one of the 25 you books that I've had published. I totally cannibalized it. Um, but it was, it was basically a story about, um, uh, a young guy. Cause I was just like 20 when I started or whatever. Um, whose, uh, girlfriend dies in a terrorist, kind of a Lockerbie type terrorist mm-hmm. thing. And at the memorial, he's, he's approached by some people that, say they want to go get some payback but the whole thing is a setup and it's 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 kind of like it looking back on it it was like a lot of twists and turns it, it involved israel in kind of a negative light which wasn't a political thing it was just sort of like cool the Mossad is able to like dupe these like young hayseed americans into sh- being at the same place where they're assassinating people that they can't you know oh, they, they can't right. th- you know they can't be caught false assassinating guys. them so that yeah. yeah they they like a false flag type ex- of thing. exactly exactly and um and so I, that's, that was my first book and I never even tried to get that in front of an agent or anything. It's like when I finished it, like I said, I looked and I was like, yeah, this book's too long. There's too many characters. I can get away with that now, but mm-hmm. like when you haven't been published, you, you just can't go bring like, you know, a James Michener novel to an agent and go like, Hey, interested in this? Cause they're, <laughs> right. they're not going to be my war and peace. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so my second book was called the last enclave and it was, sort of a historical fiction about the Srebrenica massacre in mm. in, in Bosnia. Bosnia. And so I have a, a young American army sniper who goes AWOL from the U.S. Army because he wants to actually ply his trade. And so he goes and he ends up working for the Serbians, but then he switches sides and it's just kind of this thing. And then and then it shows them t- him 20 years later in another uh, conflict where he's he's older and and um and I, I like that book too. Mm-hmm. Um, it never, I, I, I tried to get that one published and I got a whole lot of like, you're a really good writer. You write action really, really well, but this book is like too ambitious uh, for somebody that hasn't been published. Mm-hmm. And then I went to see this agent who is my agent to this day. And he's, he was the agent that I wanted because um, a guy named Ralph Peters, I don't know if you're familiar with the name, but yeah. um, magnificent thriller author, as well as historical fiction, he wrote, he writes um, Civil War historical fiction. Also, it was a big pundit on TV. Yeah. Um, I think a professor. Him him and Bob Adolf are, are good friends. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I've never met I've never met Ralph, but his agent was this guy named Scott Miller. And so I looked up like who's Ralph Peters' agent because mm-hmm. it's like that would be my dream one because I, I thought Ralph Peters is so good. And so I went and met this agent and um, and so he read that second book and he's like, okay. You know, you're a good writer, good action. If you write something like more marketable, and I'm like, tell me what's marketable. I don't have a clue. Right. So I wrote a whole nother book, and it was called Goon Squad, and it had this character, the gray man in it. It was about him, but it was a whole different story. And he, you know, that took me, whatever, nine months to write, another six months for him to get around to reading it because, you know, he had, he had real clients. And he called me up, and he's like, hey, I'm not going to tell you what you want to hear. I think this is good. I think there's probably agents that would take this and, you know, get this published, but I think you could do so much, you know, you do so much better if you took this one little subplot of the story and made that a whole nother novel because Mm -hmm. it was like more interesting. And, uh, and I remember going like to myself, like, can you give me the names of the agents that would take this? Because I do not (laughs) want to go write another damn book. Right. And, uh, and so I was really depressed for like a day and a half. And I was like, all right, that guy gave me like five minutes of positive, feedback on what he wants and it was like you know relentless action he wants a book where you just have a guy with a gun in his hand on the cover you know it's like that level of uh 
you know, just direct. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm just literally going to choke this guy to death on what he just asked for. And so I wrote the gray man and the opening scene of the gray man is just this bonkers, chaotic shit. And it just stays, stays like that. And it was basically wrote that entire novel for this one guy. And he read it and he's like, okay, I'll accept it. And then he, he sent it out to 10 publishers and nine of them said no. And he said, okay, if this last guy comes back with a no, you'll need to write something else. And the last guy um, took it. And he, the last guy was Tom Colgan, who's still my editor now, 20, whatever, 23 out of my 25 books. Um, he's the publisher of. And, uh, and then it, Scott is still my agent to this day. So these are the first people I hooked up with are, are still who I'm with. Do I, I, I'd like to hear you tell for the folks out there who aren't familiar with your books. I mean, what, what that first novel was about, because I remember, I, I can't even remember how I came across it, but I remember reading it. And, you know, like anytime you go in with a new author, yeah. never read anything from this guy before. Yeah. What, what, what am I going to get when I when I open this book? And I just remember being like blown away. Like, yeah. just like this is awesome what thanks. this guy came up with. Thanks, thanks. And, and like I said, I was trying to write something like really straight and as accurate as I could possibly make it. But my agent, I sent him the first 50 pages and it, it starts uh, in Iraq mm -hmm. and the hero is an assassin um, that, with kind of a moral code. And he's just assassinated somebody in Syria and he's slipped back over the border into Iraq to get extracted. But he comes across a downed like American uh, like National Guard helicopter. And he the way I wrote it at first is he just got to bear it. And he's like a mile away and he's like, I'm just going to get some payback for you. Know, there's like Al Qaeda guys, you know, standing over the bodies and, uh, and he just shoots some people and that was that scene. And then he goes on to his thing, but the agent's like, Oh, that's really cool. I love this opening. Um, he needs to save somebody though. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I go, what? And he's like, he's, I, I need him to save somebody. I was like, well, how's he gonna do that? He's like a mile away. He's like, dude, you're the author. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah. And I remember going like, well, that's so phony and fake. And I'm like, Okay, but I got to try and sell it as hard as I can. I'm writing this book for this guy. And that like informed the whole series, you know, like going, pushing the envelope and then just saying, fuck the envelope and, and just getting a little bit out there, but right, but right. desperately trying to sell it to the reader anyway. So, you know, the, the gray man is injured like really, really bad throughout this book. And, um, you know, I talked to a, a guy who was a former medic at Fifth Spe Fifth Special Forces Group, and he talked me through, like, you know, where he could get shot and it wouldn't be as debilitating and all these sort of where he, he could get stabbed and, you know, you know, make it and all that. And um, it was the novel itself is, is just a spy thriller about this assassin. <laughs> it all takes place like in a two or three day period. It's kind of like a spy version of Die Hard to a degree. Yeah, yeah. Um, he has to rescue his... Uh, they made a movie out of it uh, last year, as you said, and we can talk about that later, but um, the movie and the book are very different in some aspects. And so that the hero um, is trying to save two little girls who have been kidnapped um, by people that want the hero's head on a platter. And uh, and they know that he cares about these kids. So it's he has to run through this gauntlet of, of killers, mm -hmm. and they all know he's coming, and they all know where he's going, and he still has to, and he's wounded 26 ways to Sunday. And I'm going to sell this book a little bit more for you, right. Mark, because the, the premise of the book, to go a little bit further for people, is that you know he's a contracted assassin. These guys want him dead, and they put out like an open contract on right. this guy yeah. to, to kill him. Yeah. So there's all these players from these different nations yeah. are at the table, all these different hit teams, and yeah. they're all converging in Europe to try to kill the protagonist, yeah. uh, Court Gentry. Yeah, and they get a bonus if they're the team that does it. Right. And um, so that that's the that's the setup. Uh, in in the movie, it's it's a little different. There there are definitely the different teams of killers in the movie, but the the. I have to say one thing that I felt was missing from the film was one of my favorite characters you came up with in that novel was the South Korean assassin. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's, yeah. He's always like in the shadows on the video teleconference. Yeah. And he's the yeah, guy yeah. that they would send in North Korea to do ops and stuff. Right. He was he was like a very good nemesis for. Yeah. For thank court you. Gentry. Yeah. So like all the other kill team, all the other countries sent like six guys 10 guys 12 guys and then this one country just sends one dude you know this korean guy and uh you know he ends up 
getting closer than anybody else to to taking out the hero. So John Wick three totally bit uh, like they totally took your your international cobble of of assassins. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I'm not going to lay claim to inventing anything. Sure, sure. You know, it's funny. There's there's an amazing, and if you haven't seen it, you guys totally need to watch it. You can watch it free on YouTube. Uh, a movie called The Man from Nowhere. It's a Korean action film. I think I've and seen it. It's, it's incredibly good. Yeah, um, I think I'm came out, check it out. It came yeah. out in 2010. You will not see anything better on cinema as far as just bonkers action and balls to the wall. It, it's, it, I'm so glad that Gray Man came out before that movie came out and just by a few months. And um, everybody should see The Man from Nowhere and, and give it a good 20 minutes to really get going. It starts out looking like it's going to be a little bit cute and funny. And then it, it, you just won't believe where it goes. I mean, it involves like harvesting organs from uh, kidnapped children. So it's, you know, it's, it's heavy stuff. But at its core is this former a government assassin who befriends this young girl and then she's in peril type of a thing. So it has some similarities more than, more than the John wick does, but same idea. So I'm going to, we're, we're going to have, these are like some mild spoilers. I, oh, we want to do a promo yeah. for, uh, um, go ahead, Dave. So first off, uh, our, our sponsor tonight is Mike Taylor and, uh, vitamin one. So if you haven't seen his episode, I think it's two fourteen. uh, Mike is kind of a legend in the SF community. Um, and one of the things that he realized is that, man, when you're hot and you're sweaty and you're thirsty and you, you know, and you're depleting those electrolytes and you drink one of those sugary, crappy brands of electrolyte placements, it just, it's all sugar. It doesn't work. It gives you that ugh, feel. Uh, so he created vitamin one, uh, no sugar, vitamins B1, B5, B6, B12, uh, uh, biotin and niacin and all the electrolytes your body needs you can get it off amazon link is in the description below but it's vitamin one we it's delicious we love it we've drank we drank all of ours. we got it here in the studio um oh it, yeah uh, we drank all ours we're on our next order from amazon but check it out you guys will love it i promise um and then also um our second sponsor is us uh join our patreon um pay our help us pay our rent um, you get ad free episodes, uh, episodes, and there are a lot of cool people there. There are a lot of cool people. I mean, really all the coolest people are there. Uh, and if, uh, those who support us at the highest level, uh, we invite those folks to our Christmas party and they're free to come here and join us in the studio, have some cigars with us. So, man, I don't know what's better than that. <laughs> um, sometimes I don't even feel like I deserve being here in the studio with us. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and also, if you haven't liked and subscribed, please do that. Uh, help us get to 100,000. Um, we'll have we'll get Jack and Sailor Moon cosplay <laughs> or something once we get to 100,000. And if you're a podcast listener and you don't watch us on YouTube, please jump over on YouTube when you have some, uh, you know, a spare minute and like and subscribe on YouTube, even if you're never going to watch it. Uh, anyway. Back to you, yeah. So the Gray Man, when your first novel goes out, I, I take it that was a pretty, uh, you know, rousing success for your uh, writing career. I mean, that kicks it off, right? Well, yeah, that was the, that was the first one to get published. Um, it came out as a paperback only. Um, it it wasn't one of these books that went to auction and you know, like the, the fabled stories. Um, I got a very small advance for it. But the good the good aspect of that is the publisher didn't have to spend all that much money on me and I overperformed. Right. So that was great. Um, yeah. And so it came out in 2009. I actually optioned it to Hollywood about a month before it came out. And uh, I, I remember when I got the book deal, uh, I, I went to New York to see my agent pretending like I had some other reason to come up here, but I didn't, I just wanted to, you know, I was like, I want to go to New York and like have lunch with my literary. Agent. Yeah. It's like a dream come true. So I was like, yeah, I'm going to be there anyway. He's like, Hey, let's go to lunch. I'm like, yes. Um, and he's like, yeah, you know, I got a call from, uh, uh, an agent in Hollywood who wants to read the manuscript because you know, they like the, the log line of, of what the story's about. And I, I remember thinking like, Okay, that's never going to go anywhere. And uh, and then like a, a year later, I had an agent in Hollywood and uh, had a couple of studios offered something, and and I just listened to him. And he's like, ah, let's don't take this one. I think we can do better. And um, New Regency was the studio that ended up getting that first option. 
And at the time, I was like, this is never going to be made into a movie. But this is so cool because I'm this guy with this dinky little paperback and nobody knows who he is. And at least I get to go, yeah, Hollywood picked up the rights to this. And that that was going to be like my little commercial for it. Right. And that's all I needed. You know, it's like, yeah, they gave me some money for the option. Yeah. But but like the the cool thing was it just gave me a, a little gravitas. I'm a real author. Now. Yeah, this exactly. Real, yeah. yeah, it's not yeah. It's not just a paperback. So, right. So, yeah, it, it was um, I'm glad that it happened, even though that first studio they they held it for about five years and then I got it back and then I went to another studio. So, uh, you know, out of curiosity, because, uh, you know, your books, your first three books that, you know, you didn't publish were uh, sort of thrillers, right? Mm -hmm. Or had, yeah, yeah, that, sure. had yeah. that feeling. Um, and maybe were not as in intelligence or special operations mm -hmm. focused, I don't know. But yeah. how did your research evolve from those books to the mm. gray man yeah that's a great question um i around 2004 so i i wrote gray man in 07 but my first book i finished in um 2005 uh the one that took me 15 years and 1990 to 2005 exactly 15 years um i started taking um going to a, a firearm school in middle tennessee called tactical response and i, I started taking like pistol classes there and then carbine classes and then you know you know night stuff and then like five-day contractor classes and i was just sort of like uh it's like the mascot of that place i was just there a lot in in the team house and and uh and honestly i started meeting people there mm -hmm. and so i wasn't it wasn't even literally i i had like really really bad social anxiety into my 40s like really bad like the the thought of me calling up somebody like you or whatever and be like, Hey, I have a question about a military thing. You got a minute to talk. So I couldn't do that. You know, 40, mm -hmm. 42 year old man. I couldn't have done that. Um, <clears throat> I started working with Clancy and then it's like, you got to get these guys on the phone. You just yeah. have to like suck it up. It's like, you don't have to like it. You just have to do it. And, uh, <laughs> and now I'm fine. I don't have the social anxiety anymore. I can reach out to people, but it was, uh, it was super tough to, you know, find out information without talking to people. But I started going to these firearm schools and there'd be a guy there in the class with me that was like a drone pilot at Creech or whatever mm -hmm. at, at, in, in Nevada or, you know, a SWAT guy that was involved in the, um, the Atlanta bombing thing, not involved in it, you know, what I mean? mm -hmm. uh, like in, involved in like, you know, going after the Rudolph in the woods and all, mm -hmm. you know, so, so like I'd literally be in the next bunk for these really interesting people and, and I would just pick their brains uh, as friends, mm -hmm. you know, and if it was one of those things where I had to reach out to somebody that was a pilot at Creech, I, I was way too chicken shit to do that. But, you know, it's like shoot with this guy for a few days, you become friends and then you just talk to him about things. So a lot of the stuff I got up until doing Clancy, which started in 2011, um, the, all the gray man stuff was just stuff I kind of learned on my own and I'd taken, uh, like some long range shooting classes. And one of my books, uh, that was not published was about a sniper. <clears throat> I'm not a sniper. Um, I didn't even own, you know, like a, like a Remington right, 700 right, or whatever, you know, right. it's like, but I'd, I'd shot them and I'd read like, you know, that John Plaster book on sniper, uh -huh. you know, like I read it cover to cover. And I was just you like, Oh, you have it. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, uh, so I just, I'm a little bit obsessive about certain things, which helps you in some ways and doesn't help you in other ways. And, and, uh, and so I, you know, I wrote like it as a sniper and I'm very, um, empathetic. I'm always thinking about the reader's experience and I'm always trying to make the reader believe something. So like when I would write these first scenes about being a sniper and it's July in Bosnia and it's hot as hell and he's laying there and it's the sting of the sweat in his eyes. And, you know, his, you know, he's, he's got to move his nuts around because he's uncomfortable. You know, like you're looking for all these little things and it's like, I don't know any of this stuff, but it seems like it might be real. You yeah. Know? It seems like it might be a thing. So it wasn't until I started working with Clancy to where my research was, okay, I'm going to reach out to somebody on a naval destroyer and ask them about undersea warfare. Right. Or, or, you know, I got to find an F-18 a couple years ago. And, and, That's uh, awesome. Yeah, it was really awesome. And uh, 
all these things and I've, you know, talked to agents, former agency people. I joined AFIO, which is the Association of Former Intelligence Officers. Um, you don't have to actually be a former intelligence officer to join the group. And I've been to like symposiums and things like that. So I, I do the research that way now. I, I will say the one negative thing, <clears throat> the, the positive thing is that publishers want me to write a lot of books, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. The negative thing is this year I'm writing two books and it's really, really hard to get the research um, mm -hmm. to, to do as much research as you want. I just wrote a book about artificial intelligence. I read a million things and a million podcasts, um, but part of the book takes place in Cuba. And my t plan was to go to Cuba. I think I've been to 38 countries researching Gray Man and Clancy books. Wow. And I wasn't able to go to Cuba this year. I went to Mexico, which is another location in the book. Uh, I've been to Guatemala, which is another location in the book. But... Um, you know, like my, there was just no way to fit this Cuba trip in to the to thing. I, I want to go to West Africa this later this year. Uh, I'm looking for some sort of contact with the State Department or something. I know I, I just need to do the reaching out um, for another book that I'm writing um, because it involves sort of diplomatic security and the book that I'm writing. And, you know, it's a book that's coming out next summer. I haven't written the first word. I mean, there's already artwork for, you know, it's just like that's where I am in my career. So it's a really fast pace. And so I'd never feel like I get as much research as I'd like to. The, the, the one thing that happens is when your book comes out, then all the people who are experts, they reach out to you. <laughs> sure. And it's like, God, I needed you a year ago. Yeah, but yeah. there's really no way to, to do that. Sure. And I've literally, you know. One of the Clancy books I did involved like Lithuania and and I was asked to speak at the Lithuanian embassy about it. And I'm, I'm literally like, yeah, everything I know is on those pages. You know, it's like, yeah, it, there there are real experts. I would just be there, you know, flashy, but not, you know, like any more knowledgeable than anybody else that is read books or listening yeah. to podcasts. And I, another <clears throat> challenge also is like, I think if you're not a published author, if you're working on your first mm -hmm. book, and you reach out to like retired intelligence professionals <clears throat> or retired soft professionals, whatever, they'll be like, Who like who's this Jim Oak? Yeah. And 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 it <laughs> well, like, I still get that. <laughs> and, and and is this like an like is this even a real person or is this an intelligence mm -hmm. gathering? Right. You know, like is this a bump? Yeah, you absolutely have to approach these things the right way. Yeah. Um and I've I've had people a friend of mine who was a thriller author, I guess he still is, um, who was it also was also a journalist. He told me something that he told he told it to me at the right time in my career because it was when I was still dealing with all that social anxiety. He said, "You'd, you'd be surprised by how much people want to talk mm. about what they do," and you probably run into that, um, Jack. Um, and and overall, that's true. Yeah, but. Um, God, I wrote a book called Ballistic. It was a, a gray man book that took place in Mexico. And I was looking for some inf info on the cartels. And I reached out to this guy. He's, you know, what happens at this point is like, I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who can right. send me to this guy. Well, I went down until it, it was like a, a really big shot DEA guy down there and all that. And I was like, hell yeah. And I reached out to that guy and he's like, I have no, absolutely not. I'm absolutely not going to talk to you. <laughs> and I'm like, totally respect that. I, I realize that at the end of the day, I'm the fanboy in your careers. And I'm just here trying to like glean the cool stuff. And if you don't want to give me cool stuff, that's cool. I can pull it out of my butt if I have to. Um, you know, I, I have had that happen, but I've also had you know, CIA guys that are like, Hey, meet me at this bar at this time in Alexandria. And I got so much shit that I wear a white you. hat. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. almost. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah. And a carnation, <laughs> and, and, you know, it's interesting. You don't stand out. It, it's interesting because you mentioned Tom Clancy and how that got you in. And, and really, I think Tom Clancy, like, I don't know his story in terms of how he, you know, got to like the point where you got to where you had written three books. Yeah. But Hunt for Red October, obviously one of the things that, uh, that made it a success was he was passionate about the yeah. research, In right? Incredibly, and and that's not something you can fake. Just like, just like tactics or or the basic nomenclature for weapons and ammunition, yeah. Yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. You know, if if you call around a bullet, people are going to be like, yeah. 
like I and yeah. and not just not just like veterans or cops or this, but people who love that type of work right. know all this. Yeah. They people who love that kind of work know more about ballistics than I do. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, yeah. um, and and so you know it's like how do you sort of balance that? Because obviously there's a fantastical part in the gray man, right? Mm. That it, it's probably safe to say that there is no international cobble of assassins, mm -hmm. but, but yeah. that's, but that's, that, that's the world yeah. that you built, which that's is your artistic conceit. Right. It's like, that's, uh, if you're going to read my book, you're just going to have to buy into some stuff. And, right. You know, it's just right. like, otherwise don't read it. Um, but with the inner workings of, uh, not even the inner workings, but like the perception of how like the CIA works or the yeah. perception of how an assassin might work. Yeah. Like how, how do you research to that? Because, you know, because there aren't like really, you know, these, yeah, there's, there's contract not, there's not really running to, around. Right. There's uh you know, the mini manual of the urban gorilla and stuff <laughs> right. like that, which I own all those and the anarchist cookbook. And I've read all that stuff and catch her on the rye. You're on the list. Yeah. <laughs> catch her on the rye. Um, yeah, I, it's a good question. I mean, just a lot of it's just made up or extrapolated from something that I have done or I have experienced or somebody that I have talked to. Um, you know, I will, when I wrote The Gray Man, there's a character named Zach Hightower who's sort of the Gray Man sort of team leader when he's on this like imaginary ground branch six man team which seemed like a good idea when i wrote it back in 2010 and now i'm sort of stuck with it you know <laughs> it's like as you learn more stuff you go like yeah i've got I've built that into the story so i've just got to continue this bullshit <laughs> forever right. you know it'd be like but it, it works it's the world that you built exactly right? yeah. and i've and i've met you know cia operations guys yeah they're like oh i love your books i mean yeah. you know obviously it's yeah it's, it's not real but i mean i love them um but these guys you know the they're out, there's like, there's like a version of, of the guy that I want. So right. I, was, I was talking about Zach Hightower, who's this character who's very, has this real dry wit. Um, he's a little bit comic relief, but he's also a badass. Well, he was completely based off a guy who was a, a trainer at this civilian contractor school that I was taking classes at, um, who never laughed at his own jokes to where you go like, wait, that was funny. You know, it's like he doesn't even seem to know it's funny, but he does, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's just that, yeah. like that level of dry wit, yeah. this guy named Jay Gibson, I'll give him a shout out. And, um, I sit there. We uh, love you, Jay. Yeah. I, I, I truly, um, I truly, like, I remember talking to people in class. I'm like, I would come here just for the fucking jokes. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Not even for the shooting. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so that he got built into a, a character who is, you know, like ex team six guy or, you know, um, and that's not who he was, but that version of sure. him. And, and the same thing as the gray man. I've, I've met a few people since I started writing. I've never met anybody anywhere like that. Right. And now I, I meet people and I sort of like take little bits here right. and there. Right. But a lot of it is completely made up. And when it comes to assassinations, I've kind of read it, every assassination of everybody that's ever been assassinated. Right. You know, it's like I'm, I, I do go down those rabbit holes of like researching how things are done. And then I, you know, extrapolate from there. And, right. Um, I've I, I've done like some op four and shoot houses for SWAT oh, that's teams fun. before. Yeah, yeah it's a, a blast. Yeah, super intense. With Sims. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and they hurt. Yeah. I mean, if you have the towel, it helps. Yeah. Um, and then like your pants, you have like twelve, you know, rounds right in your crotch. Everybody's trying to shoot everybody in the dick. It's so sad. <laughs> um, but I was doing it too. Um, but then that goes into a book and it's right. like my little goofy, you know, middle-aged guy in a, in a op four class that becomes, you know, a dev guru mission against, a you know, a, a palace in Peshawar or something, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, it's That's just fantastic. like, and I was in like North Mississippi, you know, when I did this. Well, the, the clever thing too, was that you put, you know, the protagonist as part of like, I think in the book you call it the, autonomous asset program or something. I wish I could have that back. <laughs> that's uh, one of those things. It's like such an on the nose name. That's not really how the agency works. Sure. But <laughs> I, I mean, if you made the guy like a, a ground branch guy or a Delta operator, there'd be like, I think like even you as a fiction author would feel obligated to get that exactly right. Yeah. Whereas if you put him in a make, as far as we know, this is a fictional program. It's like yeah. six, right? It's you have the, yeah. uh, you have a latitude, right? To yes. Yeah. Although, um, and, I made uh, Court, my hero, 
he worked with Ground Branch for a while. And so there's a book called Sierra Six, which came out one year ago. Uh, no, Burner's the new one. Yeah, Sierra Six. Um, and it shows him as a young guy, and he's no mil- he has no military experience, and he's moved over because he's an assassin for the CIA and part of this like special group that nobody knows about. And they move him into a ground branch unit, and it made sense in the book. I can't. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I want I want to go through uh, some of it, you know, through through the books. Um, you know, the second one was uh, on target. Yeah. In uh, mostly, I, I recall is taking place in Sudan. Correct. And uh, you know, one of the things you had, uh, I thought that was interesting that you played this into the book was uh, Court is addicted to opiates. Yeah. Which happens to a lot of guys who get injured. Like that's not some fictional BS. I mean, it happens to a lot of right. Lot and of it, dudes. It's, it's an interesting thing that happened in my career because it was only my second book that came out. I thought that made sense um, because of the, all the damage. You know, I, I didn't want to just sort of like gloss over the fact that in the last book, you know, he's basically dragged off off screen at the end. But so I had him. Ad- yeah, I'll take a little thing. Um, I, I I had him addicted to opiates, and here's what I heard from the readers. Everybody that was X this or that, everybody that was like military is like, how did you know? Thank you. You know, it's like, it's so cool that you did that. I'm so, you know, like, that's such verisimilitude, and like, you, you totally nailed it. And then everybody in their mom's basement was like, he's, he's the gray man. He's, he's not going to do that. Right. You know, so it's just sort right. of like, it's like, he's right. weak. He, he wouldn't be weak like that, you know, but it was just like the guys who knew, and actually I knew some of these guys personally, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. military guys that I'd gone to like firearm schools with or whatever. And they're like, Oh man, you, you hit the nail on the head. Yeah. Uh, I'm a chronic pain sufferer myself. I had a bad back surgery when I, when I was like 34 and have like permanent damage from it. And, um, so I've never had an opioid addiction. And if I did, I probably wouldn't announce it right here on the show. But but I I but I could see. Right. I, hell right. yeah, I could see. Right. You yeah. know, go you know, getting ahead of yourself and, and taking it when you don't need it. Um and uh, you know, it, it was funny because when Arn Target came out, a lot of interviews, people be like, That's you know, really interesting how you did the opioid addiction. It's like is is that something you deal with? Like and, and I'm always like, No one asked me if I was an assassin. Right. <laughs> it's like right. one specific thing. Right. right. Um but I kind of wrote that out of the story. And just to give a, a little caveat about that, and you, and you know some of this from being a writer, Jack. It's like um, my last book, Burner, the, my female protagonist, um, who's a, a former Russian SVR, flipped to the Americans. Her name's Zoya Zakharova. And she has an alco- a, you know bad problem with alcohol and some cocaine and stuff like that. And I've heard from a lot of female readers that are like, that's bullshit. You can't do that. You know, like she's, she's too tough. And you know, it's the exact same thing. And I'm always like, it, it's called a story arc. That's right. the beginning of the book. And right. then she, you know, learns and changes throughout the story. It's like, if you feel like it's sexist to not have a female character go through stuff right. in their life, right. then I can't help uh, you. Yeah. <laughs> if they're a Mary Sue at the beginning of the book, then what's the exactly, point? Exactly. What's the point? It, I mean, it's, it's not fiction, though. I mean, that part of it. I mean, how yeah. many case officers have struggled with alcoholism? Sure. I mean, sure. we're, or special ops guys yeah, that yeah. have struggled with substance yeah. abuse who live in that high-pressure environment. Yeah, yeah. I used to work with a, a guy who's a few years older than me. I was a lot younger uh, before I was a writer, and he was an Army paratrooper, and all he did was talk about his back and his fusion and all this other stuff, you know, and he, he got out of the military when he was like 25 or something. And yeah. he was maybe 40 at the time yeah. and was just dealing with, you know, chronic issues for the rest of his life. And it just, you know, carrying an 80 pound pack. And I mean, you, you guys know better than I do. So book three was uh, ballistic. Yeah. Which uh, it's been a little while since I read that one, but I mean, I recall really liking it where Court takes on the Mexican drug cartels. Yeah, he does. I, I created sort of a fake cartel that was based on specific cartels, La Familia Michoacana, which is like a very sort of like spiritually based thing, and the Zetas because it's a military, ex military guys. And um, Ballistic <clears throat> uh, was a book. There's a scene in the book where uh, somebody gets their face sewn onto a soccer Mm -hmm. ball. And that really happened. That really happened in the drug wars. And um, it was left in a bag on the guy's mother's front stoop, as awful as that is. But Don Winslow, who's a fantastic author, he wrote this book, The Power of the Dog, not the one that was made into a movie. It was 
oddly, there's a, another book with that title, but it was about the, the drug wars. And he has that see, he has that event happening in, in his book as well. Well, it kills me, uh, Mark, because I'm a lucky author number three that I'm pretty sure I bled that into, into a book. I you did? You did? Yeah. <laughs> because I, I think, uh, was it Narco Land? Was one of a, a nonfiction book about the cartels? Yeah, was that uh, the um, um, the Bowden book? No, no, I think it was. Was it uh, Grillo that wrote that book? But there's Not a sure. there's a nonfiction book about the cartels where yeah. they talk about that incident. Yeah, yeah, I probably read. And, that's probably one. Anyway, because I, I, I remember when I read Ballistic, <laughs> I was really happy. I, I, I mean, it was intentional. I didn't read your book until I had finished writing yeah, what yeah. I was working yeah, on because I, I didn't feel, I didn't want to yeah poison the well yeah. yeah. Um, but we, we obviously, we like did some of the same research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Don Winslow did the same thing. And, it, and it's, I mean, like you read that and as a fiction write, author, you go, it's like, God awful, that's horrible. But I'm trying to portray this stuff. And right. that, how better can I mm. shove this down people's throat and say, this is how awful, you know, this is happening. Um, yeah. And then book number four was Dead Eye, where the court goes up against another assassin. Mm. And is this the book where you finally find out, like throughout the books, you're, uh, there's all these references to like something that happened in Ukraine. And I think yep. maybe this is the one where you explain yeah, what happened. Yeah, that is. Yeah. Um, I knew I couldn't just keep teasing that out <laughs> for, for too long. I had to figure out what it was. In the first book, I've always liked books where when you read the first page of the first book, you feel like there's like more things have already been going on. Right. The character's got a history to them on page one and page 10. And so in The Gray Man... People, he doesn't talk about how great he is. He doesn't buy into his own hype, but people think he's the best assassin in the world. He's like, I'm just basically staggering and stumbling through, you know, my day. But there's this lore about the guy. And so I needed something like everybody's like, he did that thing in Kiev. And everybody's like, no, that wasn't one guy. It's like, no, I heard it was him, you know. And so I just had started using that as a little sort of like callback in the second book and the third book. And by the fourth book, I'm like, you're going to have to come up with something really <laughs> impressive. So it involved a skateboard and, uh, and missiles and aircraft. And, um, yeah, it, it was, I remember the whole time I was writing that going like, it's got to get bigger. It's got to get bigger, a bigger story. But yeah, that was, so before. you went the opposite way of Marvel with Nick Fury's eye. <laughs> you went, you went yeah. the other way. Yeah. Yeah. I went the other they way. made it something yeah. dumb. Yeah. 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 I, had to, oh, I had to pay it off. Uh, yeah. Uh, book five was Backblast. I really like that one because nice. Court Gentry goes back to Washington, <laughs> D.C. Like So through through all these books so far we've been talking about, he's being hunted by the CIA in yeah. addition to everything else Yes, and he doesn't on. know why. Right. Uh, you know, he's like, he, he thought that, you know, he'd done everything right, but the CIA is trying to kill him. And so for fi five books, you don't know why. And, and that's another thing. I'm like, you got to pay this off. He, I didn't know this was going to go this long. But so it's like now I've got to actually... You know, come up with something that's that 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 makes you know that that's big enough because you've been talking about it for four books. And, and so that book is like him really going back to DC and like confronting all this right baggage. <laughs> yeah, figure out why there's this sort of like you know kill mission out against him. Uh, number six, I just read. So I, like in the last like couple of weeks, I've read three of them. Uh, Gunmetal Gray. Yeah. It was really cool. You introduced this other character, female character, yeah. Zoya. Yeah. Who's, a, as you mentioned, an SVR assassin. Yeah, yeah. And her and Court have this sort of interesting relationship as and, they're hunting this Chinese hacker who's on the lam. Right. And so I just wrote the 13th book, and Zoya is, is in that one. She's not in every book. Um, I never wanted to. So when I when I worked on the Tom Clancy books, there's so many, like, Clancy characters. You know, Jack, uh, John Clark and Chavez and Caruso and, and all these people that I was always like for the gray man, I always want it to be him. And then there's, there's some other people that come and go in the s stories, but I don't want to be committed to have, you know, these 13 people in every, in every single book, you know, it's like, I want the, the book to be about the, this guy and then the others thread in and thread out. Yeah. You know, she's a cool character. I mean, there's a, uh, with the, the female action heroes, there's so many tropes out there. I feel yeah. like it's easy to trip over it. Right. Sure. But, I, I like that she's ha kind of has her own agenda. Yeah, <laughs> it's on her own track. Yeah, yeah, she's she's not the same thing as the gray man. Like they complement each other, but at the same time, there there's uh, there's friction here and there. She kind of um, he, he kind of 
considers himself a paladin, although his head's not exactly screwed on straight, you know, but he, he feels, and she's just sort of like, yeah, no, that's not me. You she's know? she's full on chaotic neutral. Yeah, she, chaotic neutral. That's good. Uh, so the D&D reference? Oh, you yeah. That? oh yeah. yeah. So that, no, that was, a, that was a good one through Hong Kong and Thailand. I think most of the action yeah. takes place. And then Agent in Place was, is the, uh, I like that one too, where the, it takes him to Syria yeah. in the middle of the Civil War. Yeah, yeah. That was one of those books. Um, the one I just that just came out, Burner, was another one because it involved the war in Ukraine. It's sort of like I'm writing this book now. I don't know what it's going to look like a year from now, but I'm mm -hmm. going to just sort of have to like wing it and guess. But um, yeah, Agent in Place. I didn't. I didn't. I did not go do research in Syria. I did go to France, which a lot of it takes place in France. Um, so you know, if you can go to either Syria or France, you're going to go to France. Sure. And, and if you want to come back, I uh, yeah, th that was. I'm, I, I like it when you have them like in a war zone like that. It just feels like the pressure is like that much higher as opposed to like London or France. Or yeah, something. yeah. And I, I like mixing, like when you do this many books. Right. You want to mix, you it, want to mix it up yeah. in so many ways. So in, you know, Sierra 6, it goes back into the war on terror and he's involved in, in Pakistan or whatever. And, and the new one, um, there's definitely some combat, but it's not a war zone. He's in Cuba. Um, it's denied territory, I guess, but you know, it's very different. Um, no, I, I felt like, yeah, agent in place. He was like really, really in over his head. Yeah. Uh, so mission critical, uh, is Zoya's back and I don't know how much I want to spoil from the, give, give it away for folks, but there's a big, big terror plot. Yeah. Against the intelligence community. In right. One. Yeah. Against the five eyes mm -hmm. and a lot of it, most of it takes place in the UK. Uh, uh, I think I'm right about that. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, think, yeah. I think almost all of it. Yeah. <laughs> when you write enough of these, you're going like, all right, which book was that? Um, but yeah. Yeah. So now we're getting to the ones I haven't read yet. Nine is uh, one minute out. Uh -huh. what, what do you want to tell people about one minute? Well, out? one minute out was the only gray man book that hit number one on the times list. Cool. I've, I've hit, you know, three, four, five, you know, many times, but um, one minute out is uh, about uh, human trafficking. And it's one of those things that I went into it just not really thinking about what I was doing. And once I got in there, I was like, whoa, what a minefield yeah. for a male to be writing about this. And it's like, I can't, I mean, it's sexual trafficking um, yeah. <clears throat> specifically. But basically the hero is doing a mission in Bosnia, killing an old warlord, uh, like Bosnian warlord. And he finds the cellar where he has kidnapped women. And he is just a way station for this American operation to to bring these to traffic these women to to different places and so the hero has to sort of like go through this you know like underground railroad of evil and mm. and find his way and it actually ends up in los angeles of all places and um yeah that was a tough book to write because as i got into it many times in my career i'll be writing you know i was writing a book about that involved the war in ukraine i'm like I don't know what that's going to be like in, you know, nine months, but I've already written 40,000 words. I can't start over, you know, it's like, so, uh, I, I've stumbled into, uh, to some of these books and, and one minute out was one of those where I was like, Oh wow, this is some really heady stuff. And then as you do the research, you go like, Oh my God, I have a, a duty to the, you know, hundreds of thousands, hopefully millions of people that read this or see it if it's made into a movie to, to portray this stuff, honestly, yeah, because it's just got awful. Yeah. I uh, ten, relentless. Yeah, what's this one about? I don't remember. No, I do. Uh, <clears throat> that one takes place in Berlin, uh, the, um, the majority. And uh, I always wanted to write a, a spy novel in Berlin. I wanted to get an apartment in Berlin. I I used to live in Cologne, Germany, for a little while. I studied German. Uh, I've been to Germany is one of my favorite places on the planet, and all the good spy novels, you know, from World War II on take place in Berlin. So I wanted to like live in Berlin and just like get steeped in it and just really nail this. And the pandemic happened <laughs> after I'd already started the book. So I didn't get to go do my time in Berlin. I've been there enough times before and I've mm -hmm. lived in Cologne. So I was able to, you know, make it feel real, but it, it involves, uh, kind of a weird story. The United Arab Emirates, um, has a plot to, it involves Iran and I don't want to give away too much, but, um, but it, it becomes this big espionage novel on the streets of Berlin with the gray man and with Zoya and with some of the other main characters. 
And then you mentioned Sierra Six, which mm-hmm. is book eleven. Is that a straight prequel or no? It's it's a half prequel. Okay. So it it takes place in two time periods, twelve years apart, and each each chapter goes back and forth, gotcha. and they relate to one another. So the first one you see Court as a twenty five year old who's folded into this ground branch task force that are like doing renditions and he's folded in basically by the director of operations who wants um, these ground branch guys to have this other skill set that court somehow has at 25. And, um, and I, I'm really happy with that book. It, like it, it, it was a hard one to write because you're, when you're, you're writing almost two plot lines mm-hmm. and the whole time I'm always thinking about the reader the whole time I'm going like, all right, I'm switching back to this. Is this the plot line? People are going to be like, oh, all right, I got to read this chapter and then go back to the oh, cool right, part. Right, you know, it's right. like you have to make them sort of equally um, as impactful, I guess. Uh-huh. And compelling. Yeah. And, and compelling. And, and um, that was a tough one to write, but but uh, I was really happy with how it turned out. It, it probably has more like small unit tactics. Um, you know, I didn't understand special activities division or special special activities center or whatever when i started writing gray man so i sort of set it up like i don't know what it is like little mini delta teams or or, or whatever and um and I, it works great for the stories i, right. I like i'm not changing it right you know? um but you know the more you learn the more you go like okay well <laughs> that's that's not what i'm doing you know it's just uh but but I like Sierra Six a lot because it it shows Court who does not have prior military experience. His background is his father was a ran a firearm school in in Florida, and um, everybody went there. And um, he started basically when he was a kid training with these people and then playing op four and and doing. It. And by the time he was sixteen, he was you know taking out entire like HRT teams or, or or whatever. I don't remember how how far I went with it, but. Uh, when he was 18, he falls in with a bad crowd, and he actually goes to prison. And it's something they did in the in the movie the, the same. And sort of he's he's collected out of prison by the agency to to work for them. In the movie, it's basically I don't know if you've seen the movie. Yeah. It's it's like, hi, I'm with the CIA. Here's the name of our secret program. Would you like to join? <laughs> right. And I'm like, I feel like that's not how that would really go down. Um, <laughs> but I write I write stuff that's not how it would really go down all the time. So yeah. Go ahead, Dave. Oh, is there? Is, uh, that's the last book, no. right? Oh, it's not. Oh, oh please go ahead. Uh, Twelve is Burner. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the most recent one that you have out. Yeah, that came out in February this year. <clears throat> it doesn't. None of it takes place in Ukraine, but it is about ro- Russian foreign intelligence. And there's a Swiss banker that gets a trove of documents about how Russia is is spending its money in the West, influencing elections, paying off. Um, you know, journalists paying off people in the American Congress and the German government, um, that sort of thing. And um, his name's Alex Valesky, and he is Ukrainian, but he's a he's a banker in Switzerland. And uh, and then so Russia wants that information back and wants him dead. The CIA is trying to get the information for its own reasons. They're some somewhat nefarious, n- not as an not as an agency. I ne- I never have the bureauc. I never have the agency bad, but I'll have shitheads in the agency because that makes for good fiction. There's shitheads everywhere. Yeah, there's shitheads. Yeah. There. I worked at Burger King. There were shitheads there. Yeah, you know, yeah. the, um, so, um, Bernard, I mean, takes place in Switzerland and in Italy and uh, in New York City. Um, it ends up here uh, on 81st Street, the, which coincidentally is the same street where Seinfeld's apartment is. And basically, I put it right where Seinfeld's apartment. Like, I Google oh, mapped yeah, yeah, it yeah. like at the end. And I was like, what is that? And I was like, <laughs> Seinfeld apartment. I'm like, wow, that's like two doors down from where the, uh, <clears throat> where this whole I event. Used, I used to live on the same street as the restaurant, the corner. Oh, really? 112th Street. Oh, yeah. wow. The, the, uh, the cafe or the soup Nazi? No, no, not the soup Nazi. The, the, the restaurant, the yeah, cafe, they're, 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 they're in, in all yeah. the time, the diner. Uh, and then you just finished the draft for book 13, The Chaos Agent. <clears throat> yeah, The Chaos Agent. It's about, um, well, it, 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 all this sort of, preeminent uh, scientists or engineers involved in artificial intelligence are being assassinated. And very quickly, it's presumed that China is doing it because they're about to unleash a a sort of a a weapon platform that can operate at machine speed 
and sort of take humans out of completely out of the loop. And the U.S. government has a policy to where we don't. There will always be a human on the loop, mm-hmm. and you know until until we change that policy right, <laughs> when, when right. the other guys have done it. And, and at which point we're on, absolutely on the back foot. But the story is not that. The story is much bigger than that. Um, but that's sort of the setup. On page one, it's like, oh my God, what is China doing? And then it it, it gets a lot deeper than that. But it involves uh, Cuba and um, Mexico and Guatemala, which you think artificial intelligence, you don't think about those locations, but um, there's a reason for that. Yeah, I hope I'm not spoiling it, but it's not chat GPT like trying to re- maintain preeminence, is it? No, it's not. And okay. it's not a sentient, <laughs> it's, it's not the... Uh, Skynet. Hey, yeah, it's not Skynet. Um, I wish I wrote Skynet. Yeah, I wish I came yeah. up with that. It's not Skynet because it's already been done. Otherwise, I would have loved to have done it. But but it is. It's it's actually. I've done a ton of research on the subject, and um, it is it is scary. You know, it is is literally uh, very scary. You know, the potential for for things and things are happening faster than anyone has yeah. anticipated. Even the people, you know at the cusp of this or yeah. going like, wow, we thought that would be 2030 before this happened and it happened in 2019 or, yeah. or whatever. So while you're writing this whole series, also the Tom Clancy stuff is cooking off for you. Yeah. Right in the middle of all that. How, yeah. how did that come about? And when, when did you start writing those books? Yeah. So 2011, so I'd only had two books out. I had Gray Man on, on Target, two little paperback books. Gray Man did pretty good. On Target did less well. Um, and I'd turned in the third book, Ballistic, <laughs> to the publisher. I was a full-time writer, um, not because I was being just shoveled cash, but because I'd agreed to write these books and, and uh, you know, I, I was committing myself to it. And I got a call from my agent and he's like, hey, are you sitting down? I was like, yeah. And he's like, how would you like to be Tom Clancy's new co-author? And I remember going like, oh shit. <laughs> and it's like, I just felt like, oh, please don't make me do this. Cause it's like, I'm going to screw that up. But I'm like, well, I got to, I got to work for it. And I was a huge Clancy fan. I'd read everything. I have first editions of so many of his books that my dad gave me at Christmas. And I would give my dad a Clancy book at Christmas in the 80s and 90s. And my, both my parents passed away before I ever got published. Um, but I knew the characters really, really well. So when they asked me if I was interested in it, I was like, all right, I'll write up 50 pages like I'm writing a Clancy novel. Right. And, and I'll give that to Clancy's people and see what they think. And I did, and they had me come up to Baltimore and meet Tom, and um, you know we hit it off. And and I wrote uh, the first one was called Locked On, and we we're talking about research and and talking to people in the know. And so they didn't know if this book was ever going to come out. The first one, Locked On, because they didn't know how well I was going to do, and how you know if if Tom and I would ever finish the book or whatever. So I was not allowed to say that I was writing a, a novel with Tom Clancy. So I had to go out there and start doing the phone calls and, you know, reaching out to people, going to the Pentagon and, and ODNI and, and these other places. But I couldn't tell them, I, you know, I was like, God, if I just had that calling card, right, like, right, I'm, right. I'm writing a book with Tom Clancy. Yes, bona fides yeah, to get you in anything, Yeah, the right? door was, yeah. doors would open, yeah. but instead it was just like, here's my little paperback. Um, right. I'm writing, I'm co-authoring a novel. Um, with when, somebody who wrote a a <laughs> uh, big series and knows a lot about submarines. See, yeah. so that's funny you say that because it's like I was too chicken to do that. But then like my agent, I was somewhere with my agent and there was another author there. And it's like, Mark's going to do some co-authoring. He's like, really? With who? He's like, oh, we can't say, but with a, a very prominent legacy techno thriller author who, you know, would be a household name or whatever. Yeah, and I was going yeah. like. I don't know. I can get away with that. Yeah. <laughs> but it was at that point, it was our, you know, it was pretty late in the game. But yeah, after that first one came out, locked on, I remember sort of like announcing it to like my Facebook, you know, fans or whatever, like three weeks, five weeks before it came out when they finally said, okay, we're, we're going to go with this. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, so I did a thing this year. Um, and yeah, I did, I did three with Tom. We had just finished the third one, which was called Command Authority. And it was about Russia attacking Ukraine and taking over Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. And that was in, it came out in December of 13 and that actually happened wow. in February of 14. Jesus. Um, but Tom passed away like just weeks after we finished that book. And, um, and I didn't know that he was dying. I mean, I, the last time I'd talked to him in person, he was saying that he needed a liver transplant, but he was very upbeat about it. Mm. And, um, and I, maybe that's not even something I should say. I don't even know if he ever 
got that or needed that or whatever. But I remember him saying he had some medical stuff, but he was very, you know, upbeat about it. And, uh, and, you know, so I was as stunned as anybody else. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and if you really liked the guy, I was fascinated by, it. I would have done, you know, I, I would have liked to have kept working with him. His family asked me if I would continue the series after he passed away. And I, so I did four more, um, two in 2014, one in the summer and one in winter. Wow. And it was, it was a, it was a tough, I, I took a year off from Gray Man at that point, but, um, you know, the, the Clancy books are big books. Uh, <coughs> being a fan of the Clancy stuff, you know the responsibility that you have sure. to, you know, my buddy Josh Hood, who who wrote some uh, uh, Treadstone, some books uh, with yeah, the, yeah, Robert Ludlum stuff. Before. Yeah, yeah, Josh is a great dude. Um, he's like, I feel like I've been giving a keys to a really, really nice car, and people are like, it's not yours, so don't mess mess it yeah, up, you know, don't scratch yeah. it. And I was like, wow, that's exactly how you feel, you know, how you feel when you do those sort of things. It's like, I, you know, it's like I'm, I'm going to do the best I can, and I'm going to try not to make it worse. <laughs> and uh, but yeah, so I, the last Clancy book I did was in 2016, and I truly, I did seven in six years, and I truly didn't feel like I had anything else. I didn't feel like next year's book was going to be any good. You know, I, I just felt like I had squeezed the lemon <laughs> dry. And so uh, I stepped away. But it was an amazing thing, you know, to have that opportunity. And there have been uh, some other, I'm trying, I, I always get confused and get it wrong. But I mean, the, who are the authors that have subsequently taken up after you? Uh, yeah, so Mark Cameron mm -hmm. replaced me. And uh, gosh, I'm going to forget somebody. Don Bentley yep. does them. Mike Madden has done some. Um, now Andrews and Wilson. Andrews and Wilson. Um, um, yeah, yeah. We've had them on the show. We had, oh yeah, uh, yeah, we had, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I yeah. know they're. And congratulations, gonna, guys. We're yeah. super proud and super happy. Yeah, for you. I know they're going to do a great job. Yeah, and I and there's actually I think a, I don't even know if it's public, but there's somebody else I know that's going to be involved. Um, so you know, it's it's in really good hands, and it's it, you know they've gotten people. I I had I had been squeezed pretty dry at that point. I was like, I I feel like. I've done all I can. It's time for me to get off this train. Right. It's right. going to be sad to watch it drive off without me. That's but a, no, I mean, that's a pretty good run. I mean, yeah, seven, it, seven yeah, bucks. exactly. Yeah. I'm glad that it happened. Yeah. We, we had Don on, we had, uh, Andrews Wilson on like it's, it, it's, and you know, I don't, I don't think, uh, Don had the opportunity. Was it, what was it like for you? Like switching voice and, and obviously you had the, the good fortune of working, yeah. with Tom. Yeah. You know, to to do that was was there a process for you did he help you in that or or because you had read so much did you kind of just sink into it? I feel like just knowing the material already um you know like I was like when I write I'm not going to write like I'm pretending to be him when he was alive or even after he passed away. I'm you know, I'm just going to write but I'm going to have the characters say things that I think that they would say or right. or whatever and I'd be I would I would learn our editor was kind of the guardrails on that. Tom Colgan, um, you know, he he would go like, yeah, I don't think Ding would do that that way. Um, but gosh, I was I was very lucky and very happy to to have the opportunity. And you know, it it was the changing voice between Gray Man and Clancy seems like it would be a problem, but it never really was a problem. And I've 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 ghost I've been the ghostwriter of a couple of books. Where I can't even say, you know, my name is nowhere on the books, and I did that while I did Gray Man as well, and I never it, really had it. A, wasn't any of the Deckard books, was it? <laughs> Deckard? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes, I did. I'm, I'm, I'm your ghost. Um, it, it, it's really fascinating. Um, I, I would really love because you've written a lot of books, and yeah. and I, you know, you've talked about like the payoffs. But I'd love to know sort of the process for you because, you know, you talk about Goon Squad and that uh, that your publisher, like, picked out one one yeah. person, one thing. What was Goon Squad originally about? The best I remember, so there's this character named the Gray Man who's, like, known as this, like, uber elite assassin. And he has to team up with this, like, very low-level um, intelligence guy. And, and it's in Paris. And, um, basically it's almost like it, it, it was just kind of a very broad story and it wasn't enough about him, but there was one subplot that while he was trying to help this, you know, like 
just sort of like wet behind the ears intelligence officer do his mission. All these people were try- were after him. And I remember my agent saying, like, if if you got rid of the other guy and just had the gray man do his thing, he's like, and that's your title. He's like, your title is the gray man. Um, and and if you had him with all these people, they're just trying to kill him for stuff that he'd done in the past. If you have a reason that there's this gauntlet that he has to run through and he has to go after all these teams. And I'm like, like what? And he's like, I don't know. You yeah. Know? He's like, that's your problem. You know? Yeah. And, and so, uh, so I was like, okay. So I came up with this thing that there's this company called Laurent group that is like a big French conglomerate and they have a, a natural gas deal with Nigeria and the president of Nigeria's brother um, was involved with Al Qaeda and had just been assassinated by the gray, gray man. And the president of Nigeria is like, I'm not signing this until you bring me the, the gray man. And by the way, I'm leaving office in like six days or whatever. So the this French conglomerate had to pull out. They got their head of security, who's this German guy, and this lawyer who is kind of screwed up the contract in the first place. Who That's who Chris Evans played in the movie, although... Mm. It was very much an action role, whereas in the book, he's not an action character. Um, and, and so that was basically what the gray man was. But yeah, it, so I just took this one little aspect of Goon Squad throughout 90 <laughs> percent and then beefed that up. And, uh, and it was all my agent's idea. And, he, and clearly he was right. <laughs> yeah. So and then uh, what, the whole thing of um, like, how do you. So when you come up with a story, when you go, okay, now, like, so I've got the, I have my character. I know who he is, but I don't know why people are trying to kill him. Um, you know, I don't know what his end state is. What is he, is, is it just to survive being, yeah. you know, the target? Yeah. Like, how does all that form for you? Yeah, I think I just know from reading so many novels that it can't just be about the guy surviving. There has to be a ticking clock. The ticking clock, and this is all metaphorically speaking, you know, there has to be a ticking clock. And at some point, the ticking clock gets sped up. You know, it's all these, you can call them tropes or whatever, but it works and it, and it makes it fun for the reader. Um, you know, you've, you've got to have, you have to have a, a, a hero with vulnerabilities, which is a, a problem that a lot of, you know, people will try and get me to read their stuff and, and I don't. Um, because I can't, because, you know, everybody's like, Hey, when you get a minute, will you read my book? And yeah. I'm like, are you different than me? Cause it takes me a few weeks of my free time to read yeah. a book. You know, it's like, it, are, yeah. are you asking me literally for nights and weekends for the next couple of weeks? Cause I just don't have those to give to everybody that, that asks. But when I would look at stuff, a lot of times you would see like, wow, the hero is this square jawed, bat, Billy badass right. dev guru guy. And his only vulnerability is he's out of ammo, but right. doesn't, you know, <laughs> right. the, the other guy's got a magazine. I care too much. <laughs> yeah, I care too weakness. much. Yeah so, yeah. so you have to have a guy like with, with strength or a woman with strengths and vulnerabilities. Right. And, you know, you have to have yet. One thing I've learned along the way is that your story has to be personal um, to the, the, the stakes have to be personal because I think I've written some gray man books are a little bit more about, the Syrian civil war uh, and he has to rescue somebody's, you know, family member or something like that. But then the ones where it's like, he's got to find out why the CIA is trying to kill him. And he finds out that he's maybe done something wrong mm-hmm. and he can't live with himself. And mm-hmm. you know, that those personal stakes or the woman that he loves is imperiled. And you know, it's, it's really personal like that. A mission critical, uh, the woman Zoya, um, finds out her father is involved in, in some stuff. And, uh, and so it's very, very personal. And those ones with the personal stakes are the ones that the readers like the most. So there's all these little things you learn along the way or know at the beginning, if, if you're doing it right. And, uh, you know, you can't just make it about the heroes trying to kick ass right, and take right, names. You right. know, it's like you can make it look like that, but when things go off and, and not to criticize anything else, but, the the movie take the first taken movie enjoyed it absolutely yeah. enjoyed it <clears throat> but if you watch the film his daughter's kidnapped at the beginning he does 83 things right and the worst thing that happens to him is he gets knocked out handcuffed to a pipe which he pulls the pipe down and kills all the people right and then he wins so like for me i need a little bit more vulnerability in the right. hero i need a little bit more like wow that that went off you know 
in left field there. And, and, you know, so in, in the gray man, it's like entire aspects of the story happen and don't work for him, you know, don't work out for him. Um, you know, like he, he goes to get documents from a forger and oh, the right, forger right. throws him in a pit and, you know, calls the bad guys, you know, it's like he gets out with the skin of his teeth, but he doesn't get his documents, you know? Right. So, I, I like stories like that. I like it when it, you know, it's just like, oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. You know, he's so backed into a corner. As a writer, it's tough because I always tell myself, write your guy into the corner and then right. worry about getting him out later. You I know? did notice that you've never really gone for the easy answer. You know, the e the easy thing in these books would be, you know, the backpack nuke in downtown Manhattan. Yeah. Right. Something yeah. you've never done that. It's always much messier. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I kind of like messy and I kind of like, I, I learned along the way and I think it was gunmetal gray where I was, I was near the end of the book and I was trying to figure out what I was going to do. And I was like, what if my hero did something that readers wouldn't necessarily agree with, but it, but it made sense in the hero's mind. And so Gunmetal Gray, without giving the end of it away, his his want at the end of the book isn't what the U.S. government wants. And probably what most of the most readers would be like, no, do, do, do it this way. But it didn't match up with his code. Right. And right. I remember like kind of wrestling with that a little bit and going like, I mean, people like what I do. I, I just have the confidence to write what you think is good and, and see how people you know, respond to it. And people responded really well to it. So there's. A lot of times in books, he'll do things where you're going like, dude, don't do that. Not because yeah. it's stupid, his, but because it's like a it's different... His, his ideological belief sometimes. That's exactly like, right. Court, why are you doing that, man? It, don't it, do it. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it's, it's like I don't want to, you know, write books that are just like, you know, the fans are going to like cheer machine, everything. Yeah, yeah exactly. They're going to cheer every every scene. So Right. Hopefully yeah, I mean, like none of us have like that third person omniscient type of like, right. thing going on, right? right? So why would why would a character always exactly. get everything right? Yeah, exactly. He's gonna screw he's gonna screw up. What do you always know the end of your book or do you just kind of write and see where it goes? I wish I knew the end. Every time somebody asks, like, you know, how do you, you know, plot the book out or whatever, I'm I'm always like do you have any ideas? <laughs> I mean, I, I truly, and I truly mean that. I'm like, just give me something. Um, I always feel like my life would be so much. My wife is a painter and, um, and she sells them, but she doesn't do it for a living, but she's an amazing painter. So she has this uh, studio in our house. It's a, a big room and I never go in that room because it's always such a mess and there's tarps everywhere and there's resin and crap on everything. And, I was in there for something recently and I just started looking around. I was like, there's an amazing painting. I don't know what the hell that is. That's obviously a mess. This thing got tipped over and this is there. And then that painting maybe isn't perfect, but I really like that part. And I thought, wow, that's kind of what my brain looks like to me. You know, uh -huh. it's, it's kind of completely confused, completely jumbled. And when I write a, a novel, the book, I just finished the chaos agent, my first draft is 190,000 words. Well, the book cannot be more than 165, and that's a long book. Uh -huh. So I was just writing, meandering, trying to find my way to the end. So there's entire chapters where people are going like, all right, here's how we're going to get into Cuba. We're going to do this, we're going to do this. Well, you know, and you know you're supposed to <laughs> show, not right, tell. Right, right, right. Um, but this is me trying to work it out on right, the page, right. and that's not great writing. <laughs> the The final book that comes out next February is going to have that all all that edited out of there, but I'm trying to figure it out. So I don't have the ending. And, and this book, more than others, the one that I just finished, I really was struggling for the ending and I'm, I'm still talking to my editor about one aspect. I'm like, well, what if he did it? Or what if he did it? You know? So it's a little bit up in the air. I always try and write, write it out beforehand and never, never get it all. I have a book due in November that I haven't even started yet, but I have a plot, but I'm going to diverge from that on page one, probably for you. What would you say you have a plot? What, what, what does that mean? It's, it's what, not the beginning, middle end, right? It's correct. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm writing a book. It's the second book in my armored series. The first one came out last year. It's about a, that was about a civilian military contractor in Mexico. And book two involves him, you know, a year, a couple of years later, and he works for the state department for DSF Di diplomatic security. And he basically goes on uh, a mission in Africa that is so easy peasy that he brings his family along to, uh, you know, go to a safari when they're done. And I mean, 
it wouldn't be a thriller <laughs> if that's what ended up happening, you know. So basically, that's my plot, and I know who the, the villain. You know, I know that China is involved. I don't want to give my story away, but you know, like just sure. I know these sort of big beats of the story, but when it comes down to like you know, a big thing that happens in my novels is it's like a chess thing. It's like I need this person to know about this, but not about this, and these people have to be together at this point. But at this point, they can't see what that guy's doing. You know, like this yeah. logistic I think, I think nightmare. In mission, in mission Critical, especially, I, I, was, I was reading that and I was like, "How the hell did Mark even come up with this?" Yeah, you come up by <laughs> you come up with it by doing it wrong and going like, "Well, that doesn't work." You know, so there's a lot of things. It's like, well, why wouldn't he just tell him? And and one of the Clancy movies that was made, The Sum of All Fears, I can't remember the detail now, but I remember when I watched it, I was going like, "Okay, these people can't talk to each other, but they're both talking to this guy." Why is this guy not telling them that the nuclear bomb is about to go? You know, whatever. It was just some little thing that was like, didn't make it. Right. You right. Know, like, right. didn't make it past. Common you know, sense. The, yeah. The inspection. Right. And so, you know, there, there's, uh, there's mistakes in every one of my books. And, uh, you know, and I get emails every single day. <laughs> yeah. the, the first Gray Man book, there's at least three mistakes. Uh, I used the wrong capital of Botswana. And the reason I did was like initially the bad guys were going to be from Liberia mm -hmm. or Angola, or, uh, maybe Angola. And then I was like, no, I'm going to make it Botswana. That just sounds cool. And I just did a universal change in a Word document from Angola to Botswana, but forgot that I mentioned that they're on the phone in you know, Luanda or, right. or whatever. And that's not the capital of Botswana. I mean, that book came out in 2009 and people will email me today <laughs> and they'll, they'll be like, I'm the first person that right. figured this out, right. you know? And, and they're like, Hey, meanwhile in Kendall, it's got like 400 underlines, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And, and every right. single one of my books and, you know, my, I've written almost 4 million published almost 4 million words. And sort of my pat line is like, yeah, there's about 30. I'd love to have back. Yeah. yeah I'd love to have <laughs> yeah. a do over it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and, and so, you know, I, I've literally had people go like, Hey, I've found an error in your book. Um, does that offend you if I tell you what it is? And I'm like, I mean, it doesn't offend me, but I, I always do. I mean, I'll be honest with you. I kind of roll my eyes when I think that some, when somebody thinks they're the first person to tell me, I right. mean, uh, I had a lady one time, not to go on this tangent, but I had a lady one time that was like, "You have a you have a character who's at a her their feet are so cold because they're standing on ice that the cold I I think I said the cold's going up their legs and you know now it's in their hips like, or whatever. Here's it's how like, convection works, Mark. It, it's <laughs> like I have my doctorate in thermal dynamics, <laughs> and you know cold is the absence of heat. It does not move. Blah 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 blah. And I literally wrote the woman back and I said, you're absolutely right. I will, you know, never make this mistake again, but you need to promise me that every time you read a book where they, somebody says the sun rises, you need to write a letter to that author <laughs> because the sun does not rise. Right. <laughs> when they just, we're spinning through, you know, th through the solar system. And she never replied. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I think people want to get their little dig in. And when they find out you're a real human being, they're like, oh, crap. Yeah. It's amazing how people fold up like a cheap suitcase. And yeah. you probably have experienced that. I, I wrote one where... Uh, I, 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 the same thing it just kills me to this day. I wrote about it, an F-16 taking off from an aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you can't you can't go back in time. You can't you can't ever fix it. When I did Red Metal uh, with my buddy Rip Rawlings, who uh, an active duty Marine Lieutenant Colonel at the time, it's a two hundred seventeen thousand word novel, a, a Russian invasion of uh, across Poland into Germany and down into Africa for some very specific reasons. And we got a lot of it right. We did a ton of research. We went to Nellis. We I got on a destroyer. He got on a submarine. We went to Germany and talked to like a general, you know, it was, it was the head of their armor corps. And uh, he met with French special forces. But, like we did all this work. You're still going to mess stuff up in 217,000 yeah, yeah, yeah. words. So at one point, one of us, and I don't even know who it was because we wrote this book together. Blame him. Um, we had uh, uh, an A-10 and... He, he goes past the indent into afterburner and A-10s don't have afterburners. Oh my God. I've literally had like A-10 mechanics ask me to sign that page because it's so funny <laughs> yeah. that I F that up. You know? And I've had, I've honestly, I've, I've had emails, a, a couple of really creepy emails from people that basically accuse me of being in the Illuminati. Oh yeah. Yeah. And I'm going like, yeah, For, wait, wait, you know, like, how does that happen? I don't know. I, in their head, I, I, but it's like, I've found this error and you, 
you know, proclaim to be, you know, so smart and you're like one of these like people in charge of things. I'm like, I never claimed to be that. But I'm but, literally sitting there with a muffin at Starbucks typing with my right hand. You know, it's, it's like I'm not trying to make myself out to be anything I'm not. The, the sum total of letters in your uh, in your mistakes is... Red, 642, which everybody knows. Red, is, yeah, exactly. Red, yeah, read yeah, backwards, yeah. you can hear the voice. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> I, I've, I've had it. And I, the number of the beast. Yeah, yeah. I, there, there's people you're going like, wow, that's they're very passionate. <laughs> well, and, and you know, and that's the thing is it like, <clears throat> I, I think for fans, um, I, I, I think for two, lo- there are two levels, right? For fans, like you, you suspend, uh, you suspend disbelief, um, when you understand that. The, not everything's gonna like right. like there are there are I mean for like in gunplay in movies mm-hmm. like there are a lot of things that I like I what was the movie with Christian Bale uh, the gun kata oh yeah uh, uh, equilibrium equilibrium yeah I love that movie never seen it it's amazing it's really I love that movie it's ap- it's absolutely ludicrous right. like what they're doing with guns right. it's ludicrous yeah. or wanted it's ludicrous what they're doing but it's fun but yeah. it's fun and yeah. you sus- you suspend your disbelief yeah like yeah yeah um if if it's you know um if it's just if if they're just making basic mistakes like cocking a double barrel shotgun yeah then i'm like okay <laughs> come on like yeah, yeah. um but but also but also, I don't think that when when it's when it's like an afterburner on a ten, yeah, the only people who would actually know that, yeah, are people who right fly or maintain a tens, right. right? But I've heard from all of them. I've heard, of them. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it sounds like they have a better sense of humor about it than the people who are you know kind of the nerds about it, you know, yes. passionate about it. And and you know, this is where I go. Okay, this is karma, dude, because I remember. Um, dinging authors that I really liked when they got stuff wrong. Not, you know, it was pre-internet, so yeah. I couldn't, like, right, do it out loud. Right, right, I wasn't going right. to write him a letter, but, like, right. going, like, oh, this guy's an idiot, you know? Right, right. And it's just an, an honest mistake that's made for, you know, for for whatever reason, you know? And, and when, when we all watch films, you know, it's like every time somebody points a gun, there's the sound of, like, sling swivels hitting the side of, you know, it's, right, the point right. of those are... Right, and click, I'm like, click, 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 I'm like, God, I want a gun that does that. Right, That'd be so right. cool. I would just be out in my garage by my gun safe, just making that sound all day long. But the guns don't do that. I, I've never done it before, Mark. But now that we're talking about it, I'm definitely gonna pour myself a cup of coffee in the morning, get on my email, dear Mark. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you've dinged me before. I, I'm, I'm calling you out. I brought up because, on. Uh, so you remember it too? It was a it was a rifle. It was caliber. a rifle. It was the yeah. uh, uh, the 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 Marine one. Um, it was Jack, you weren't the well yeah, yeah. actually guy. No, and I you. think I said it was a uh, uh, five five six, and it's it's three oh eight or yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it it, it might have been. Was it? No, it was the one before this. I don't remember, but I will right. say was, I just I just yeah. gave this long speech about everybody thinks they're the first person. You were the first person because you gave, you sent me a galley copy. I yeah. think. Well, that's, I, that's, I never sent you another, did I? No, I <laughs> <laughs> that's why I said no, that it, to you because I thought you had chance a time to yeah, fix it. Yeah, no, it it absolutely doesn't bother me, and <laughs> and honestly, that's cool. Um, my buddy Don Bentley, who you guys have had on your show recently, is an amazing dude. Obviously, incredible military experience and history and FBI, but also a good writer and a, and a great guy. He was a um, helicopter pilot, mm-hmm. an Apache pilot. Mm-hmm. And um, he read an early version of Sierra 6, which I didn't know it when I was writing the book, but the end of it was going to have my hero like desperately flying a helicopter, you know, past the limits of, of reason and logic because he needs to for the story. And uh, Don was literally like, uh, yeah, okay, you got it good here, but you've mixed up the collective. And, the, you know, it's, it's like, and so he saved my butt because it did come, you know, he did reach out before it was too late. And it was just a couple of dumb mistakes. And um, every every book's got them. Yeah. You write, you well, write 160,000 mean, words, you're, there's going to be 10 words. And, yeah, and yeah. especially when you're dealing with so many different things that are like, you know, you're not writing the life of Pi, which is just like, a personal experience, <laughs> right? Like you're writing about yeah. all these technical things yeah, yeah. and nobody, those same A-10 mechanics or, uh, you know, th- those same people who are hot on the A-10 probably wouldn't pick, you know, catch something yeah. that was, you know, off on the blitz. Like it's a lot. Yeah. Um, 
it's yeah. a lot. It's it's a lot of different fields of expertise. Yes, and and sometimes it's not even really a field of expertise. I remember I, I wrote a Clancy book, and it took place in Cologne, Germany, where I'd lived for a while. And um, one of the characters was running up a fire escape, and um, I got a, a letter from this lady. She's like, "I threw your book across the room into the trash can. I live in Cologne." And in 1950, they passed a law to where there are no external fire escapes on any building because of whatever thing or whatever. And it's like, so how much research do you have to do? I literally lived in the city for four or five months. Right. And I didn't know that. And right. she's, she's so offended that, you know, like I didn't know that part. And, uh, you know, yeah. so, you're not going to win. Mark, yeah. uh, spill some tea here about the Gray Man film. The, after you had the, the first option, didn't work out, Hollywood happened, second run at it. Yeah. Uh, tell us how that came about. Yeah, so the, the option came back to me in about 2014, and then a bunch of different studios and filmmakers and even actors were interested in it. So I was on conference calls... It was, it was this weird whirlwind, like when you don't know how things work and when it happens, you're like, this is totally not how I would have guessed this was. But it was like I was on conference calls every day for like a week. And then um, the Russo brothers wanted to do it. Uh, and they had just done, uh, I think uh, Winter Soldier had just come out, which was their, their first one with Marvel. And um, I'd never seen Arrested Development or anything. I, I didn't know who they were, but I knew that, you know, like, everybody was saying that they were big deals and I had a conference call with them. And as soon as I hung up the phone, like I called my agent and, and I was like, it's these guys. I mean, it's these guys. Cause they, they liked it. They liked some specific things about it. And there, there's a lot of differences between the film and the book. There always are. But, uh, overall I really liked the film and I will defend Ryan Gosling's portrayal of the gray man to the death. I mean, he, he plays him exactly the way that I wrote him. And um, or write him, and so when the Russo brothers, you know, signed up with Sony, they had me come out to L.A. because they were going to write the screenplay, and I spent a few days with them, and sort of we talked about where the series goes and all these other things, and then I went away, and Joe Russo wrote a script, and it was a year later, I guess, he sent it to me, and I loved it, um, and then it just kind of went around in in development hell, as they call it, at one point. Charlize Theron wanted to do it, and so they rewrote. They used. They got other screenwriters, and the Russo brothers stepped away. And um, and honestly, I think uh, Christopher McQuarrie, who does the Mission Impossible, was was attached with Charlize Theron at at a, for a time. And I read the script, and it was very very different. It was like a really really di completely different story, um, and to the point where I was like, if this wasn't called The Gray Man, and she wasn't named Court Gentry. I could watch this in the theater and go like, "Hey, that looks like something I did once." I don't, you know, like it was, it was, it was, well, I wouldn't even have recognized it as my own film. You've just touched on like one of my biggest rants is don't buy a property if you're not gonna be the property. Like, let the yeah. property be its thing. If you're gonna write, like, I mean, I love World War Z, mm -hmm. but it's not the book. Right. Like, why buy the property yeah. if you're not gonna do it? Well, and and yeah, and so I, when this was all going on, I would like call my agent i'd be like i don't understand i don't have the juice for the to to make a charlie's theron film you know big because it's attached to my book or whatever right. it's like i'm not i'm not that out in the world right so like why why not just it, it's, create your own intellectual property and right and use is, that? is that why they did atomic bond is that what that evolved into for her no she did that for another studio okay. for lionsgate and then pretty shortly after that, that whole thing died on the vine with Sony. And okay. I'm not really sure why, you know, it's like I always there's there's a beauty to being like an author with an agent in Hollywood and an agent in New York when you live in Memphis, because you feel like I'm so disconnected from this stuff. Yeah, I can call somebody and ask, I guess. But, you know, I've got to write 3000 words today and, uh, you know, coach my kids soccer practice and, you know, my dog's got diarrhea so you know it's like i'm not <laughs> i'm not really going to get into all that other stuff so but. when when the film came out did that like supercharge your your writing your, your i mean as far as the series getting more attention and more readers on it yes it i mean it it's definitely been really good for sales and um i definitely got attention you know longtime fans a lot of them didn't like the film because of you know artistic things that the, right. the directors did as you're saying 
But at the same time, you also have to look at it like this. Um, the directors are creative people. The writers are creative people. The actors are creative people. The cinematographers are. They're, they're not just trying to render my pages into celluloid or whatever the hell they use these days. You know what I mean? Like, it's like they're putting their spin on things. And there's, there's aspects in the story where I'm going like, yeah, I couldn't put that in a book. I couldn't call everybody agent in the CIA, you know, <laughs> instead of officer or whatever, you know. Um, but you can do it in a movie. You can get away with it. And, um, but there's also things in the, in the film where I was like, holy crap, they did a really good job with that. Um, uh, the, the aircraft, the airplane scene, yeah, yeah. um, it was bigger. So everything was bigger in the movie sure. than I wrote it. You yeah. Know, like at the, the end of the book takes place in this, you know, big house in Normandy, France. Well, in, in the book, it takes place in a freaking castle in Croatia, um, which is cool. It's absolutely cool. But I didn't, you know, didn't have that scope or scale in my brain when I wrote it. Yeah. And this, so there's a there's a part early in the story where he's being exfiltrated out of a area with some people that he trusts, and they all turn on him while he's on in the back of a C-130, and um, and it turns his crazy fight, and the aircraft you know gets damaged. Um, the aircraft doesn't even crash in the book, but in the in the movie it does. Um, the film goes so much bigger than I had even envisioned it. I have like five guys spinning around in a playing like socks in a dryer and then they fall at the back. And in mm -hmm. this one, it's like explosions and flips. And, uh, there, there's a big, like, like a Humvee or something for some reason, like right in the middle of the, of the, you know, in the C-130. And I'm going like, why are they extracting this guy from Thailand with this, with the, you know, with a Humvee strip, you know, I, it, there was a lot of things where I'm going like, I mean, visually it looks cool, but like as a writer, you sort of have to explain the whys on things. And, and I couldn't have gotten away with that. That's fascinating. Out of out of curiosity, um, did you ever get? Did you ever ask your publisher, you why uh, why the Gray Man had to save somebody? Was it was it sort of a save the cat moment? Was it to establish his character? He's not just like hell bent on revenge, yeah. but he's actually a human and, and cares about people. Yeah, I think I think it's something like that. Um, it was my agent, so it was before oh, your agent. Yeah, sorry, before, about that's all right. Um, before I had a publisher, believe me, all this stuff confuses me still. Um, but yeah, it was this thing where it's like, okay, that's a really cool scene, but if he just shoots some people in the head and wanders off, you know, in the story, it's just not as impactful as if he, you know, and, it, and honestly, it's kind of like your agent throwing you curveball. He, he wasn't even my agent at the time, he right. was the guy that I wanted to be my right. agent, and he was telling me no. But I'm still interested, you know, like, try something else. And so he's throwing me this curveball. He's like, you know, it'd be cool is if you could do this. And, you know, I took that as gospel. You know, it's like, I have to do this if I, if I want to get published. And, um, and so, but he was absolutely right. Because yeah. it, it made the scene a little bit, like, harder to sell. But, like, I've just worked so much harder. And I always, you know, that's, that's my... You know, anybody that watches your show has got more experience in military or law enforcement or intelligence or whatever. Because I know, you know, like, I don't know how many, like, fanboys like me watch your show and, and how many, like, legit, legit people. And I think it's mostly legit people. And, um, and I'm a little illegit to be here. <laughs> I'm, I'm a writer. But it's like, I just am trying to sell it to the masses, right. but also have like somebody that knows about guns know that I know some, you know, like, right. I, I know this, you yeah. know, it's like right. the, the, the revolver, you know, like I, I read a British author who I love and I won't, so I won't say his name, but like, you know, his, his revolver ejected, you know, like they found the shell casings for this guy fires three rounds as he's running through a building, you know, and it's <laughs> right. like, they yeah. found the shell casings. Yeah. I'm going like, well, work that into the story. I don't understand. Well, and so there's a million things like that. Yeah. And, and, um, and so I'm trying to get as much of that right as I can. Yeah. And then Jack will email me if I get the wrong yeah. caliber and yeah. Yeah, I've got, got <laughs> yeah. well, no, I, I appreciate Mark that, you know, I think, you know, I've read, I'm, I'm on nine now, but I mean, you're you're not like you've come this far, and I mean you're not just like mailing it in. Like you're still passionate about yeah. this, and, uh, and and it shows. I mean, you could hire some hack like me to ghostwrite books mm -hmm. and and just cash the checks, right? <laughs> but I mean, you're still like this is your baby. You're into it. Yeah, and, and uh, thanks for saying that. I I've told my like, I kind of had a little talk with myself early on. You know, it's like I'm never gonna phone this in. If I fail, it's gonna be by taking like a big old swing that misses. And so one minute out, which is the one you're about to start, I think, 
Um, I wrote that one in the first person. It's the only book written in the first person. I wanted to do that. I thought it would be interesting. Um, And I think I said, it was the only book that hit number one. It was at the time, it was my number one selling book to the, you know, up to that point. But um, I got a lot of negative, you know, it's like when you look at it on Amazon, like, 1% 1% of people didn't like it or 2% of people didn't like it. So, you know, percentage wise, it wasn't a big deal, but the people that didn't that had read the first eight books and then read one minute out, um, some of them were just like completely insulted. And, it, you know, on Amazon, people are like, oh, he obviously didn't write this himself because it sounds different. I'm going like, if, if I was going to have someone fake write my book, I wouldn't have them change from the third person to the first person. You know, like that's such a yeah. tell. Yeah. You know, um, it's like, I'm just, I'm, let me talk you through your little art, your logic here, sir. Um, but it was, it was me taking a big swing. Mm. And I think overall it worked, but I mean, some people hate that book. And then, you know, the next book, a lot of people are like, oh my God, thank God he's back on track. You know, this book, <laughs> yeah. the last yeah. book. That last book was he's, crap, is, but but I want to fail in that regard, you know. Right. And and this book, Chaos Agent, I would have loved to have write, written one hundred and twenty thousand words in three months of this story, but it ended up being one hundred and ninety thousand words. And anybody that's been around me for the last half a year, my poor wife, you know, she has to hear me talk about, you know, that it's just I got a big load of dog crap brewing back in my office, and uh, you know, it's and I've said that about every book. It's just my work-life balance is a little screwed up. When my books are about 98% done, if my editor called me and said, if you, if you give me the advance back, we can just forget it. I would, I would <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm really yeah. not kidding because I'm like, there's no way I'm going to bring this home. It's a disaster. It's not to like my second or third draft where I'm going like, Oh, thank God. <laughs> I've, I've faked it for one more year. It's imposter syndrome. I, I wanted to ask you, Mark, and I mean, I'm not a- asking you to give a specific answer here, but I am just curious. Uh, you know, what, as, what caliber does no? I'm just <laughs> as as an as an author, like in in the back of your mind, do you have an ending for the gray man? Like, does Court live in a log cabin? Does he go out in a blaze of glory? Like, is there some sort of idea in the back of your mind? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. It's funny. I actually wrote something that didn't make didn't work in a book where it was him sort of like prognosticating his end, and. I, and I, I didn't end up using it in the book. So I end up writing lots and lots of scenes that I just save for later because I'm like, actually, it doesn't really fit right here, but it's I think it's I think it's good or whatever. I'll hang on to it and see if it works later. And so one of those times in one of those books, um, I can't even remember which one, I have him say, you know, kind of like just you're in his brain and he's talking about, yeah, I'm probably going to die like, you know, guts shot in, in, in a ditch, forgotten by everybody around me, you know, who keeps, you know, or, or whatever. And I was always thinking like, well, what if, what if that is how he, you know, actually died? But I haven't even used the first scene, so I, right, couldn't, right. I couldn't do that callback. Um, I don't want him to die. I like doing the books. Um, you know, I've done, just finished my 13th. There's another one on a contract. I would love to take a year off. Um, I don't know if I will. Um, I feel like I sort of need to. It's okay. I got to catch up. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I got it. Jack's got to catch up. I won't up. even notice. Um, yeah. So I, I like doing them. I don't, I, I would love to be doing great. You know, it's, I never plan on retiring. Like I want to, I want to die with a book half written. Yeah. That they're like, yeah, this is dog shit, <laughs> you know, but don't tell me it's dog shit. I'll be yeah. dead. Um, well, I mean, you can, you can pull the whole, you know, Robert Jordan, get, find your own very own, like, you know, Brian Sanderson, you know, like the, the next who, year. Who are these people? Uh, art, uh, authors. Oh, okay. Uh, they're a different genre. But, <laughs> okay. but, 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 but the but thing is, is, like, you know, you can you can do the Tom Clancy. You can bring on yeah. somebody to continue the Gray Man. You know, and I've always said I would not do that. But if I did it, it'd probably be Josh Hood, my buddy Josh. Because it's so funny. Because, like, he's the guy that I call when I'm, like, you know, throwing the rope in the in the bathroom over <laughs> yeah. the over the thing and you know tying around my neck and, and he calls me in, in the same situations and um and it's just funny because it's like he he'll say something about my character and i'll go like holy crap you're right and, you know and i'm like guy he's got a he's got a good feel for it but i like doing them and you know i ain't at, dead yet so. at any point Will he say, I'm getting too old for this shit as he's jumping <laughs> off a bridge? You know, 
the crappy thing is, you're younger than me. You're my brother's age, so I'm I'm fifty. I just turned fifty six. Nobody would know that by looking at us. Um, no, I it, feel it, bad right now. It's not the age; it's the mileage. <laughs> so is that, is that Harrison Ford. Um, but um, I just saw something the other day in Lethal Weapon uh -huh. when Martin Riggs. I mean, not Martin. Uh, uh, what was the other character? Danny Glover. Danny Glover. Yeah. But what was his character? Murtaugh. Murtaugh. Yeah. Do you know how old he was when he said that? No. 40 fucking two. Oh my God. <laughs> he was 42 when he goes, I'm getting too old for this shit. <laughs> I just saw that on, on social media and I was going like, Oh my God. You know, it's like, uh, Wilford Brimley was 50 when he did cocoon. That just makes you want to just go drive off into the woods. That, yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. How, you know, you, we're, we're talking about, you know, this series and, and the future of, of the gray man. Um, how is it getting more difficult because a character arc, you think a character arc happens over a story or yeah. maybe over a trilogy, yeah. right? But as you go, um, <clears throat> and, you know, not to, uh, you know, poo on Mac Bolin or, or any of these other great, Mac you know. Mac Bolin is a saint. Dude. No, I know that. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying, though. Get his name out of your mouth. <laughs> what, what I'm saying, though, is that when when a character goes and you don't know how long they're going for it's really hard to sort of engineer a character a character yeah, arc yeah. right so uh, how do you manage that how do you look back at, at you know for the continuity and the books that you've done yeah. and look forward and and still keep make still make the the character human as opposed to just now yeah you know going through the motions right yeah that's a good question he has to grow in every book and I want every book to be a standalone. So when somebody picks up my 13th book and that's the first gray man book, they absolutely are in it. Um, but for the, to reward the people that have written, have read 13 in a row, you want to see change and growth and all that. And one of the big things is early on in the series, the gray man was a little socially inept, um, because of this lifestyle that he'd had to lead. And, um, and that was captured really well in the movie. I felt like Gosling captured that so perfectly well um, that it never got schmaltzy with the little girl. In the, in the book, there's two girls. Uh, you know, they cut one from the... They, they had to use the... Ca they, had to buy, they had to buy the castle, so they had to, you know, get rid of one of the girls. Um, <laughs> and it worked out. But um, I, I feel like the when he started out in the first few books, he was he was pretty socially awkward because that made sense. But when you keep writing this guy, right, right. you have to have him do these clever things. He has to be able to do this social engineering every time he talks to somebody and is lying to them or whatever. So suddenly he has to be pretty debonair at times or, you know, like really like um, psychologically aware. He has times. to go from stirred to shaken. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so as, as the books have gone on, I've, I've left that behind, right. which I've sort of had to, which would be a normal, you know, maturity character arc or whatever it was fun when i did sierra six because you had him going back to age 25 for half of it and i tried to dial his personality back to a younger guy's personality and the other character zach hightower is 12 years younger and now he's kind of a funny like a uh, little bit comic -y relief guy mm -hmm. but back then he's like former dev guru war on terrors got a ground branch teams lost some guys um it wouldn't make sense for him to be yucking it up. You right. Know what I mean, like he's right. running these guys or whatever. So I had to change who he was character wise. And so I like to, I, I do spend a lot of time thinking about that. And, um, just the relationship between court and the woman that he loves. It's like, I don't want every, I don't want them to be there. You know, people are like, they need to settle down together. It's like, I just want this to happen to court. And I'm, and I'm like, they're shipping them. Huh? I'm like, no, you don't. Yeah. No, you don't. I'm going to write a book where, you know, they're painting their white picket fence and he's right. mowing the grass and she's bringing him iced tea. <laughs> it's like, you're not going to read that book right. or you won't read the book after that. <laughs> right. Right. So, um, I'm like, I feel like I've got to keep things, uh, pretty helter skelter for, you know, if, if these are going to be thrillers, if they're going to turn into like a Harlequin romance or whatever, right. I guess I can get away with that. Right. So what, uh, what's next? I mean, you've talked a, a, quite a bit about your upcoming gray man novel. Um, you said there's a sequel to Armored coming. Yes, it's called Sentinel, and it will be out next July. I just have to write it. <laughs> no big deal. No, no, no pressure, big, bro. <laughs> yeah, you know, so it's it's kind of like, um, you know, it's I'm, I'm in the research phases for it. I have a sort of a plot, but I really want to try to get over to Africa. I've been to Africa, but only to Algeria. Um, I'd love to get to West Africa. I'd love to have some like contact in the State Department. 
that could like, you know, have me visit an embassy or, or whatever in Ghana or someplace like that. If, if I can make that hook up, I think it'll make the book a lot better. Um, and I, you know, love, 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 you know, getting deep into these stories, you know, like into the research. I've got four months to write the book, but I mean, I would, I would drop everything. Yeah. You know? Yeah. As you know, you, you started this second series as, you know, you, obviously you, you built this world and what the agency was and, yeah. and these organizations were in the gray man. Um, as you've actually gotten to know people and you're meeting people and you learn, you know, more about, you know, special operations, right. more about the intelligence community. Uh, obviously you're not going to change the world, of the gray man, like it works right. for it, it, you know, right. It is. And you're kind of stuck with what you've done <laughs> but, but, better for better or worse. But, but obviously on the best seller, like nobody has a problem with that. Yeah. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, y you know, they, they want it to make sense. It doesn't have to exactly mirror right. what, you right. know, what the reality, reality is. is yeah. Um, but as you've grown, uh, and, and become more connected with the community, you know, you've started this second series. Is that sort of a result of like new knowledge that you have? Yes. Um, so I, I wrote this book armored, which, uh, turned into a series. I didn't know it was going to be a series. I didn't know gray man was going to be a series. I was just trying to hold a book in my hand with my name on it. You know, I was trying to get published. Um, and I, I wrote Armored because I was doing a lot of training at uh, a school where they train civilian contractors. And I just thought about a story about the contractors, not the people they're protecting, but about them that, you know, th these guys would be really cool and I could probably pull it off. And it happened. You know, the book came out. And so, you know, I, it was me learning, meeting these people along the way and, and just sort of seeing the blue collar nature of the job and you can put these like blue collar guys that my, my hero is a guy named Josh Duffy uh, in armored and um, he's lost a limb in combat. And um, he is a, basically a mall cop when it starts in, in uh, Tyson's corner, Virginia. And he um, is, had, was a former security contractor and he's asked to go do this job in Mexico, which is like, a suicide mission basically, but he needs the money. So bad. Like, you know, he's basically can't pay rent. He's got two little kids. Um, his wife was an army captain and she's a very strong, it's, she's not the, t I, I wanted to write it to where she's not the typical like wife at home with the kids wringing her hands. Like she's like, she's a former army captain. He's a former 11 Bravo. Um, he's calling her and she's giving him leadership advice. Cause he's, they ask him to run this team in Mexico. And she's like, why are they, you're, you've never been a TL. Like, why are you running this team for a company called Armored Saint, which is the in the book? It's the worst private, you know, <laughs> military contractor on planet Earth. Like they they take the jobs that nobody else will take, and you know, it's like it's custom like, arms. It, it's it's like you know, you get a you get a free body bag is kind of like one of the <laughs> yeah, perks, you know, yeah. uh, no charge. Um, so he goes to to work for Armored Saint, and his wife, who's a former like Apache pilot, is is back home at the beginning, but she's you know very involved in the story and she's in, involved in the next story. But these are like based on people that I've, I've met, um, young female military people. You know, I've just always been fascinated. You know, I was on the USS Samson and destroyer and I meet like a 20 year old African American female who's, you know, has a job. I'm like, Holy crap. When I was 20, I was working at Applebee's. Right. And I thought I was like, you yeah, know, I had a lot of responsibility, you know, <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> it's right. so stupid. Yeah. It's so yeah. stupid. And yeah. so like, I have such respect for these people, you know, and, and I like to sort of portray them. And, and, um, and so this character, Nicole Duffy, um, Josh's wife is kind of these, you know, types of people. So I, you know, yes, learning people, learning about people and learning about, you know, these things has worked its way into my new series do uh do we have questions for mark yeah i said custer arms but it was custer battles you did you ever hear about them so you know uh, like when the like afghanistan where iraq first kicked off there mm -hmm. was huge need for security people and everybody was standing up security companies and one of the companies that somebody stood up i don't even know who was called custer battles and like guys they'd hire guys they'd arrive in country and they just sound like rusted ak's it's like well there was more than one company doing that yeah wow yeah um, let's see Even the guys. good ones. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I've read some... all those books by like Robert Young Pelton and the other guys about contractors. Even the good com the good companies were doing some crazy stuff because the demand was so. The demand mm, was so yeah. Hot. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mark, I have a question. Is there going to be another Gray Man movie? Yes, there is going to be another Gray Man movie. Um, 
they are working on it. I actually know which book it is. I don't. No one's told me if I can tell. Come right on. now, right now, there's a come it, on, Mark. It's one you've read. Um, uh, right now, there is a writer strike and an actor strike. So I don't know how that's going to affect things. Probably a lot. I uh, probably a lot. Um, <laughs> St Steve McF Stephen McFeely was one of the writers on the Gray Man, and he's written a lot of the Marvel movies. Um, I think he's the lead writer for Gray cool. Man too, and um, I don't know when it's going to come out. Ryan Gosling's attached to it to to reprise. And uh, I don't know when it's going to come out, but it will come out. So, um, Did you ever get an opportunity to, to uh, meet with the cast and talk to them about the book at all? Only some of the cast. So basically, I wasn't on set at all. It was COVID time. And honestly, it's been a little bit, it hasn't been like, a, like, hey, Mark, do you think uh, he should you know, carry a P320 or a P360? <laughs> you know, it wasn't that sort of thing at all. You know, they have their armors and they, and they do what they do. But um, I, my wife and I got to go to the um, premiere in L.A., and um, they, you know, the, the lead characters, they shuffled them in and out of the room so fast because they had to be in New York the next right, day right, and right. Berlin two days after that and London a day after that. And, you know, and so, you know, like I was in the room with Gosling and Chris Evans or whatever. I didn't talk to them. I, you know, who I talked to is Reggae Jean Page, who plays uh, Denny Carmichael. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, nicest guy you could possibly meet. You like within three seconds, you forget this guy's like a Hollywood actor. I mean, he's British, but, you know, like, like, I promise you, if you're sitting here right now, you'd just be shooting the shit with him. And uh, and and Billy Bob. And um, yeah, so it was it was a cool experience to do it. Um, honestly, I was there so kind of networky. Um, you know, like I'm sitting with like producers and right, I was right, talking right, to the Russo right. brothers or whatever. And it was, it was all just kind of like that sort of stuff. And it wasn't, you know, like fanboying about seeing Chris Evans or whatever, <laughs> although it was cool, you know, and, and he did a good job. Uh, let's see here. Um, Louis Vasquez, thank you very much. What was it like meeting uh, general Klaus Feldman? Oh my gosh. Hey, how does he know that? Um, yeah. So uh, probably read it somewhere. So when I, when I wrote this book, uh, red metal, uh, Rip and I, uh, Rip Rawlings, who was a Marine Lieutenant Colonel, still active duty at the time, we went over to Germany. I went to Poland, and then we met in Stuttgart. And then we had this really crazy day where I was just throwing my credit card down, and we took a train all the way to the north of Germany to meet uh, uh, General Feldman, who I think was the head of their armored corps. Um, cool. And uh, amazing guy. We spent the entire day talking to him. And... Uh, and, and had a great time. And then Rip and I got in another train and went all the way down to like um, Zugspitze, which is down in the, you know, the German Alps on, you know, on the same day. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, General Feldman was really interesting. He took us to the, the tank museum in Munster and um, talked about everything. And then we sort of talked about our plot for this Russian invasion across Poland into Germany. And, and he's like, yeah, you know, there's no strategic surprise with the Russians. We would see that happening for a long time. And we're like, we're talking about like a operational raid, like a tactical raid involving rail and, and stuff like that. And he kind of sat there for a minute. And he's like, yeah, that would work. <laughs> and he goes, you know about how Germany has m mined all of the overpasses and bridges um, to stop a Russian invasion. And I don't, Rip might have said yes, but I was like, uh uh, I didn't know about that. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, well, we took the explosives out about 12 years 90s, ago. Something. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And then 20 years ago. And he's like, he's like, yeah, s something without strate strategic surprise could poke through Poland and get into Germany in 16 hours. Or, or he didn't, I don't remember what he said, but you yeah. know, like, and, and so, you know, it was kind of Rip and I looked at each other and was like, wow, we did not expect to, you know, that reaction. Having said that, we wrote a book that came out in 2019 about the Russians having this amazingly adept, crafty military mm -hmm. who pull off this incredible thing. And the reality that uh, <laughs> happened in 2022 is not that. So I'm, I'm, I'm as an author, I'm like, I'm so glad that book came out. I was, I was just reading over uh, the weekend, uh, Tactics and Strategy Quarterly, about Panzer Group in Two's thrust towards Moscow oh, wow. in 1941. Th those Germans, <laughs> they know their tanks. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, and, and the tank museum is this incredible place. And it was just funny. There was one tank that was very had this very short barrel, almost like when uh, they had them in Civil War. I forgot what they called them, but it's like it's this massive barrel, and but the barrel's like this tall from the ground, 
and it's a tank and it, and they have the projectile there and I wanted to get my picture by it and then the general goes for some reason Americans love to get their picture right there. and I'm like <laughs> and it just feels very, <laughs> I feel like he's going off on me I'm not really yeah, sure yeah, yeah. <laughs> or going off on my country he yeah it's like phallic or yeah, yeah. anti-phallic or yeah. something but uh, but it was really funny it was it, yeah he was he's a very interesting guy that's interesting well and you know it, it, Everybody thought that of the Russian military at the time. Yeah, like there, you know, like it's not. It's not. People might look back and go, "Oh, how could you have written this?" Well, because everybody. Yeah, you know, the T fourteen Armada was not battle tested, but yeah. we kind of assumed that they'd have three or four and they'd work, <laughs> which apparently is not the case. Yeah. Um, you know, but so you you can only go with you know the information that you have, and then they actually you know have a war and muck it up any every way to Sunday. Yeah. I mean, it's like when you haven't seen a friend since you were like 18 and you're, you know, you're both like we're in soccer together, right. Or whatever. Yep. And then, you know, you're telling, you know, your wife about him or whatever. And you go back and he's, you know, 300 pounds. Like, well, this isn't how I remember. <laughs> I mean, that's kind of what the Russians were, <laughs> yeah. right? The Russians yeah. had something for yeah, a while. Yeah. yeah. And we just remembered them differently. <laughs> exactly. <you know? laughs> yeah. We know they're spending, they're, they were spending money on military, but I think it was all for their dodges and, and their, you know, hookers in England or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then let's see. Uh, Ray Gillen, Gwian, uh, thank you very much for Jack and Dave's cosplay activities. Oh, we got a donation for uh, the Japanese squirrel girl outfit. That's right. Is on the way. Um, and we don't have anything on Patreon, so that's it. Cool. One more question. Oh, one more question. Mark, how does it, you know, how do you get a book optioned and eventually made into a movie? Is these market research? What's, what's the uh, what's the secret ingredient? Secret ingredient, I don't know, and and I say that because I have friends that are authors that are as good as me or better or whatever, and, and it's not a quality thing. Um, my guess, and my I, my agent told me that he didn't think this was true, but I still kind of wonder. Uh, the Gray Man got optioned the first time right after that movie Taken came out, mm -hmm. and it's not like taken but it is like taken in that you could male action hero exactly hero and, and you know you wouldn't have to spend 200 million dollars making that film you know like it, it um they did uh netflix did but um so you know the way to get it optioned is to write a very cinematic thing and the way you write something cinematically is if, if you are obsessed with what the reader experiences as you're writing, you're not, you're not telling a story. You're not typing out a story. You are creating an experience for mm -hmm. another person. And if you, at every point you go, is this the absolutely most impactful time to tell this to the reader? Or would it be cool if the reader thought this and you trick them and then they have that aha moment, you know, like every single thing you do like that creates a, bigger experience for the reader and cinematic is visually cinematic you know you you describe things in a visual way and make it make it big and i mean that's that's not going to get you all the way there but like if if you do that as a baseline and then create something good and unique you know the joke is do the same but different i mean it's not the joke it's like they always like people want the same but different you right know? right and uh, that's that's a hard little nut to crack. And I just when I first started writing, I was like, I'm not ever going to create anything, you know, completely unique. I'm not like her or, or or whatever, but I, I want to execute the, uh, you know, this not formula, but, the, you know, this deliver the, on. Yeah, just yeah. De deliver a, a, a good experience for people. And that's all I can do. Well, Mark, I'm uh, I'm excited to like I said, I'm on book nine. I'm excited to keep reading the series. Awesome. I'm glad that you're still writing it. Thanks, man. Uh, and, you know, I'm, I'm stoked to see what you come up with next. I appreciate it. So it, much it fun to be on. It was a real pleasure. It was a lot of fun to be here. I've, I've watched this show, as I said, for or listened to this show. 50 times. That's so. awesome. Mark. And, and I mean, I hope, you know, we can do it again sometime down the line few more books out maybe yeah. another film project out and yeah. uh when we talk again awesome i'm i'm always available um so for everyone out there friday we're going to uh be interviewing a former atf agent who was uh he did a lot of undercover work with uh outlaw motorcycle gangs so that'll be wow. uh interesting so that's for that's friday and then andy is tuesday yeah. next tuesday yeah. yeah we're we have a busy summer <laughs> we have a lot of stuff packed in 
So, uh, yeah, we'll see you guys Friday and then Tuesday.